with everyone. We have a lot of important information about what's going on with the caravan in Mexico right now for you. This is all very important, relevant information and our perspective on it here on a Mexican crossing lines is one of a kind. So I invite you to share the show out and enjoy the show with us. Share this information with everyone. You're listening to a Mexican Crossing Lines with your host, Sydney Gomez Shemp. And Duke Gomez Shemp. Here on 88.1 FM, KPPPLP Fargo Moorhead, where we're adding local color to your airwaves. I am sharing my shows about this topic, not only in Spanish, but also in English on KPPPFM.com. There's a lot of ways that you can watch our past shows on all of our social media channels and support the work of this station. Now more than ever, we need the support of our listeners and our viewers because we are a non-profit, non-commercial radio station. So we completely depend on the support of our listeners and viewers to continue to do this important work and to maintain an independent, non-profit media station here in the Fargo-Moorhead region. So please do go to kppfm.com and click on the donate button so you can support our work. Duke, how can folks get information to us? Well, there's several ways. Uh, one is a call-in line, which you can leave a message, which is <laughs> kind of cool because sometimes we use those uh, recordings on the air. And the number is 701-566-0917. Again, that number is 701-566-0917. Give us a call. Uh, tell us what you need. Tell us what you want to say, and we'll get back to you. An easier way is email. You have cindy at kppfm.com or duke at kppfm.com. Send us an email, attachments, whatever you like. Also, our, um, we've, uh, you know, of course, a Facebook. You know, the, the 88.1 FM Fargo-Moorhead Facebook page has been a place where a lot of people have sent messages and attachments and links to videos and all sorts of very worthwhile information. We've, uh, we, we try to use it. We try to wrap it in our shows. We read it. We look at it. We might not get back to you right away, but it's a great way to get a hold of us. Also, we have the People's Press Project on um, Facebook and Mexi-Can. And we have a Twitter account. It's at media underscore PPP. Again, that's at media underscore PPP. Um, and the kppfm.com website is when, where we've been putting our videos uh, and are doing pages for each one of these shows. And we've been taking our videos and putting them on YouTube. And if you want to subscribe to our U- YouTube channel, it's Duke1517. That's me, Duke1517. Please subscribe. We've been uh, putting on uh, Mexican Crossing Line videos uh, straight from the recording of the shows. So they're nice and high definition, plus they're on a different platform. Because you know how Facebook has been changing, forever changing. We see it as a platform that we utilize, that we use, and we really appreciate everyone being involved. But it's something that might go bye-bye. They've done so many changes with us, it's hard to actually have people uh, get alerted when we're going live. So we have to individually go back and invite people over and over and over again you know thousands thousands of people try to invite people let you know we're on the air and um you know if you're in the fargo moorhead area of course listen to us on 88.1 fm in the fargo moorhead region and back to you cindy um today i'm going to be covering a lot of ground i've got updates from last year um that we did on our spanish show Coordinadores de la Caravana, because I had a little bit more information by the time I did the show in Spanish. So I threw it into my Spanish show. So the Spanish show had a little bit more information, which I'm going to be sharing on today's show, which includes more information about um, Mohammed El Nakib, who has been associating with Mark Lane, uh, the TYT, the Young Turks producer. Mm hmm. As well as with the folks around the, um, what was the name of that organization that uh, El Nakib El Nakib was promoting uh, the faith, um, the faith group, interfaith group. I can't remember their name. They were in our last show. Yeah. <coughs> anyway, those. Um, organizations as well as Linda Sarsour, the creator of the Women's March. Mm-hmm. Um, 
We're going to talk more about him. We're also going to tell you about another uh, documentary, no, photographer slash veteran slash on the ground organizer and documenter since Standing Rock and probably before. Rob, Rob Wilson, also known as Johnny Dangers oh, on, yeah. his, on Facebook. We're going to cover an organization that he has been pushing, Ecate Society. We're going to also go and find out what the, a group of activists, who, by the way, incidentally, were also at Standing Rock. Uh, some of them even got arrested and ended up in our home, like Lis Lisa Fithian. Oh, yeah. Remember her? Oh, yeah. Um, that, that are doing some protesting outside of a detention center in Tornillo, Texas. We're going to go to that uh, story as well as talk about the walk run event mm. that is being organized along the border by again people associated with the asylum seekers caravan support network and the former leadership of standing rock specifically the asylum seekers support uh, caravan support network um, administrators uh, Evan Duke the third um, from the veteran stand for standing rock and Myron Dewey of digital smoke signals We'll also be covering the uh, ongoing story of some of the organizers that we have been uh, showing you from that group, like Lilith Sinclair, which okay. was spreading a lot of misinformation mm -hmm. about, you know, the previous the the um, border clash that hmm. took place last year. Oh yeah, where uh, not the most recent one, which took place literally on New Year's Eve um, or the day before New Year's Eve, but. The one that took place several, almost a month and, and change ago hmm. at the border where there were, you know, tear gas oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and uh, rubber bullets that were shot by uh, Customs and Border Patrol agents at the people that were trying to cross illegally into the United States. And uh, Lilith Sinclair has been now uh, listed as the person to call for this border support network group that is apparently uh, witnessing crossings. Oh. I, I, I think that that may be code for human trafficking. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Let's go over this together. Maybe you guys can help me figure it out. And um, also how uh, they're messaging about what's happening with the caravan right now and what the real truth of that is. Because... I think uh, folks here in the United States are only get it, getting information from the, the, you know, the radical left or the radical right, and there is no room in between for sanity and truth. So we're going to try to bring some of that back to this news story through this show, A Mexican Crossing Lines. I want to encourage you to go to kpppfm.com if you haven't watched my previous shows on the caravan and catch up, because there's lots and lots of information and by the way the shows are both in spanish and in english so going all the way back to caravan crisis uh caravan con men featuring some of the uh the heads of the groups um the consequences of the caravan the lgbtq caravan its leadership what's gone on with that updates on what was happening at the time shelter updates closings, openings, etc., as well as infiltrators, not your migrant caravan, influencers of the caravan, the caravan politics, the caravan coordinators. Those are all the shows you can go find all of them at kppfm.com. Wow. So let's get right to the heat of the meat. Last week, I was talking to you. I do have one correction to make. Um, I was talking to you about a lot of media uh, coverage around the release of migrants from detention centers in mm -hmm. Texas uh, on Christmas Day. <clears throat> and I told you that undocumented people getting released on every day happens all the time and it's not really newsworthy. And uh, maybe it should be. Yeah, you know, that's a different be. debate we could have, mm -hmm. but it isn't and it hasn't been because it's a daily occurrence. It's not something unnatural, inhumane, or uh, indecent, uh, unfair, cruel, um, that violates the, the, the morality or the human decency standards of our society. It's just an, you know, a common everyday thing that happens. P 
people are released from detention facilities, just like people are released from jails every exactly, day. Exactly. Yep. And we don't have news people out there like <clears throat> maybe we should. Like I said, we mm-hmm. could we could debate this, but I'm just saying it's not currently an issue. What is an issue is that there was an unscheduled release. What does this mean? Well, typically there's releases of people that happen every day. But in these communities where detention centers exist or where the facilities are close to a town, um, those places have churches, shelters, organizers, uh, community members, etc., law enforcement, all of these entities are well aware on what schedule people get released and where they get released such that there are other people already waiting for them usually. So it's not going to be some weird situation where people are released on a, at a time and at a place where they're not expected to be released. Because, of course, that would cause them to be stranded many of them don't have any way of calling anyone they might have a number that they wrote on their arm or something but they don't have a cell phone or a means to call people so that that would be uh something more difficult to overcome and that is what happened in this case it was unscheduled and nobody was notified about it and they were left they were dropped off in a location where they're not usually dropped off. Okay. They're usually dropped off at shelters. And the <clears> fact <throat> that it was done on Christmas Day, of course, raised eyebrows. Here's my analysis of it. Do you remember what else was going on during this time? Do you remember what's been going on this entire time? The government shutdown. And what happens during a government shutdown is that the two sides are battling Uh, especially over the optics of what's going on around the border wall and making demands about the reopening of the government. So as hundreds and hundreds of federal workers are languishing without pay and our government is not running, not functioning, there are a lot of government agencies that are not open, not working because Mm -hmm. of the government shutdown. This mistake that hasn't happened before happens that makes people really upset at the federal government's agency that you know let these people out on the streets without anyone knowing that they were there fortunately there was a response from the community uh pretty much that took care of this crisis but uh you know, obviously, it, it was a situation that seemed weird. It seemed weird for a reason. I think a lot of these things are going to be manufactured crises mm-hmm. created for the optics, whether it's to benefit the, the, the extreme right or to benefit the, the extreme left, to benefit somebody, but not the people in this caravan, exactly. not the people that mm-hmm. are getting out of detention. So they're not, they're not gaining any brownie points by this happening to them. Um, I also showed you that there was a group of people that miraculously were able to find people that they had been helping in shelters in Mexico when they were released from detention centers here in the USA and hook up with them again and, and give them shelter. And one such person was L, uh, Muhammad L. Nakib. Um, here he is posting or somebody is Uh, tagging him along with some others like Yusef Miller uh, in another post about a group of people that were dumped, quote unquote, dumped by U.S., uh, by by Border Patrol on the streets of South Dakota. Really? Yeah. So they're saying that Rapid Response Network can only take about 97 people in South Dakota, which means that there are rooms needed in South Dakota right away for all of these folks that just got left out in the cold. And this is on September, excuse me, December 28th, as you can see. And as you can see, tagged in this message, again, is Mohammed El Nakib. So it would seem to me, Duke, that they have now established a nationwide network Mm. around these detention centers 
to house and give um, ongoing, uh, you know, sponsorship yeah, to people you go. going out of detention. <clears throat> what does this uh, uh, appear like to you? Well, I'm not quite sure. It's, to me, it's kind of confusing that all of a sudden they would be dumping people in South Dakota, but there are so many people in detention across this country. That's not that unusual. And they'll get, they'll get court dates. If, if, if they're able to get a court date and have a hearing, it's not going to be where they got you know detained. They spread them out. I, I read where a woman was in Iowa City, and she had a detention hearing in uh, Kansas. But the, she, uh, she got to Iowa City, and there was families there that would help her out in their place for her to stay. But with this group that's doing this coordinating, you know, it, it, it's, I'm just guessing at what it all means and what, what people are doing and how they are putting things together. And I think you're totally right when you're talking about trying to create the visuals. You know, what, what better yet is to have hundreds of people dumped out in the middle of a street in the middle of the night on Christmas Eve for visuals for whatever the people are trying to use it for. Like you said, whether it's the right or the left or, you know, the trumpeteers or whoever's coordinating some of this stuff. But a lot of the stuff that's going on is really strange. And that's why we're exploring it and we're finding these Standing Rock phonies who are connected to so many of these things and they're picking up new people in this network and I think they're picking up people who have actually done really good work, but they're getting swooped into the fray. They're getting swooped into the con. And that's what we find the closer we look at and deeper we look at any of the information we get, we start seeing these patterns. So I, I think that there's unusual things going on. I think you're totally right when it comes to the shutdown. There's a bunch of, of federal workers who aren't getting paid, and they have substitute people that are in there, and, and they're, they're possibly never going to get paid. And uh, the work is suffering because of it. Well, there's also this other element, and that is, you know, we call them Standing Rock phonies because we found out that people that were passing themselves off as media people didn't have any real media experience yeah. and weren't telling you the, the whole truth about what was happening at Standing Rock. And in many cases, were there to manipulate what did happen what the outcome was, and what the propaganda around any particular event was. And guess what? The very same people that were out at Standing Rock doing that are now in Tijuana doing the same exact thing. One of those people is Rob Wilson, the photographer. You may recall his photography from Standing Rock. You know what I recall most about Rob Wilson, the photographer at Standing Rock? Yeah. That when he appeared at something, when Rob Wilson or AKA Johnny Dangers mm -hmm. was live streaming or photographing something, something big was about to That's go true. down. There was going to be tear gas involved. There was going to be milk and magnesia washing of eyes. There was going to be um, explosions, tear gas. There was going to be, um, interestingly, video of you know the military or the police uh, coming in and doing maneuvers and movements that mm -hmm. only were able to live stream from that one channel yeah. where no one else could live stream. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that when Rob Will Wilson appears, what's his name? Rob Wilson? Yep. When Rob Wilson appears, when Doug McLean shows up, when these specific photographers, a.k.a. journalists, a.k.a. whatever you want to call them, I call them agitators, phonies, because they they do not they misrepresent what they're there to really do. When they show up, things are about to get real. Things are about the poop is about to hit the fan. People are about to clash. The clash is here. The clash is coming when these people appear. And believe me, that's exactly what they are there to document. They're they're also there to shove it along, mm -hmm. to agitate it, to create it. They create the storm. They create the perfect storm in which a crisis occurs. They create the crisis, and then they appear to be the rescuers mm -hmm. of the crisis. And they, are, they appear to be the storytellers of the crisis. And then they cash in on the empathy and the tear-jerking and the pulling of the heartstrings that they um, put out in the media. They collect on that too. And hey, if there's a death in there, why not? Let's collect on the death. That's what these folks have been doing. 
And that's how uh, it's turning out right now for the people of the caravan in Tijuana. So when I saw Rob Wilson's video, I was mm-hmm. like, uh-oh. Yeah. Something is about to go down. <clears throat> and folks, I am not joking. All of this happened just as I predicted it would. Here's one of the videos where you can clearly see that Rob Wilson is not just there to document what's going on at the warehouse shelter in the northern part of Tijuana near the border, but to do reconnaissance. I Mm -hmm. mean, he's literally filming the police to figure out what the police are doing to get an idea of what's about to happen to signal to organizers within the warehouse about what's going on so that they can prepare to take action to thwart the authorities trying to remove them from any specific area. This is not a group of refugees in need of shelter. This is a group of activists in an active protest to shut down commerce, to shut down a border entry for political purposes. Here's a video of Rob Wilson. This is live from Benito Juarez outside of the warehouse. The police are in riot gear and they've shut down the block within the last hour. So I'm walking through now. You can see they got trucks. They have two big charter buses. There's two. Count that three. Three big buses. Federal police. We're still one block away from the Benito Juarez Stadium where there is a lot of municipal and federal police in Tijuana. I mean, they're stretching down to many blocks. Lots of cops. It's looking like, looking like a raid on the warehouse is imminent. Um, I'm gonna get as close as I can and see what we can find. So, here we go. It's about 12 cops standing out here now. See if I'm able to get closer or not. Buenas noches. What's uh, what's happening here? Very good. I just have the live. Yeah. No habla inglés. Uh, no habla español. No, tú solo estás hablando. Okay. 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 I'm so Okay. Gracias. Okay. So, cops won't let me get close, (laughs) but there are many. Well, it looks like a raid on the warehouse turned makeshift refugee camp is about to get raided probably within the hour. Um, I will keep you all posted. So 
In the midst of this conversation about immigration here in the United States, I find it, you know, I, I it's one thing to try to make people in this country who tend to have a xenophobic um, attitude toward refugees and immigrants, I mean, in large quantities in this country, mm -hmm. to have a conversation about humanitarian treatment of people um asylum uh visas being expanded uh worker visas being expanded uh you know the 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 lottery being expanded all of these other things um you know and and getting rid of quotas for people of color and things like that now if people are so rigid on their views about this in America can you imagine adding to it the um, the rhetoric of militancy that undocumented people have every right to come into this country and demand uh, that they be put on an asylum uh, hearing list that will inevitably, because of our backed up system, guarantee them uh, if they're actually given a number like all of these people have signed up to you know oh, yeah. get a number to uh, request asylum not that they will be granted asylum but in their processing of their request they will be given a uh, work visa to be able to stay in the co unless they commit a crime or they you know they're doing something subversive they'll get a work visa they'll be able to stay here sometimes those hearings be are backed up a year or two so regardless of the outcome, you're going to get to stay and work legally in this country for about a year-ish, mm. right? Yep. Uh, for a lot of these folks, that's what it's going to be like. For a lot of them, if they end up in a detention center, they may end up having to spend the entire time that they're in this country in a jail, yeah. in a detention center, and then, not being able to work. And most likely getting deported at the end of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. But, you know, like what people are hopeful for is that they'll be, if they get put in a detention center, they're going to be released with a ankle bracelet at least, right? Mm -hmm. And that they will meet, be able to meet bail. And this is what the process that most of the folks in these caravans are probably expected, expecting based on the information that has been fed to them by these organizers, by these leaders who've made promises they absolutely do not, they don't even understand immigration law. They can much less make promises or guarantees of any of it. But attitude is everything. And if those folks we're coming into these countries, in, into our country, um, violently hurting, uh, injuring Border Patrol uh, and um, other uh, law enforcement as they did when they entered Mexico. Mm -hmm. And in the process, also demanding different kinds of food, demanding to be able to be the ones that run the shelter and run the rules of the shelter and and get to decide what happens to the donations coming in to those shelters, to those facilities, occupying public roads, shutting down commerce and schools and defecating and urinating in the public streets, causing health hazards, et cetera, et cetera. America would be up in flames about it, right? Yeah, like yeah. Americans would not stand for that. They'd be <clears throat> no. like, "What mm -hmm, on earth mm -hmm. is going on? How did how did these uh, you know undocumented people in our borders think that they have the right to demand all of these things?" Now, on top of that, imagine that those people who had the audacity to come into your country and occupy streets, shut down commerce, shut down border entries, shut down schools. Um, and and also uh, make these demands of being able to run the shelter that they're in, getting an, an extra shelter because the one that is being run by the government isn't up to their standards, uh, staying in the streets and occupying the streets and being given chance after chance after chance to um, 
stay there after they've been told that it's a health hazard and they had to leave. On top of that, they want to demand that while they go through this asylum process and while they're being put in a detention facility, which is the standard procedure that happens here, uh, they should expect to be uh, put it up in a hotel or taken care of when they get out. Hmm. What when they, when they get out, they need to have a sponsor home, a place to live, somebody to you know take care of them and pay their rent until they can get on their feet, or for as long as it takes for them to wait for their hearing, maybe even. And um, that uh, they need to have people offering them jobs, you know, putting together job opportunities for these folks so that while they are out with a with a work visa they can take advantage of that to the, its maximum potential and so uh if you can imagine how absurd that sounds to you mm-hmm. let me just tell you that this network of activists is trying to provide just that now i say it sounds absurd because the infrastructure doesn't exist for it uh there are a number of nonprofit organizations that have been working on helping migrants with legal clinics, giving them some kind of support or advice. But for the most part, the network of people that has helped folks get out of detention centers and taken care of them are connected to the people's families, directly to the families of those involved. Why would that be? Well, for one thing, they have a vested interest in making sure that their family member is safe and productive and you know that they're taken care of right for another it gives accountability back to and control back to the family of the person of the migrant of the refugee what have you so why is that important well let me tell you folks no matter what do-gooder has a hold of any of these migrants no matter how good of an activist, how long they've been activating, how much organizing they have in their history, what their background is, whether it's in journalism or medicine or whatever you you wanna come up with, uh, clergy. Never in the history of vulnerable people have they evaded being taken advantage of by any of those well-meaning people. Not the church, not the media, not the authorities, Vulnerable people are taken advantage of because they're so vulnerable. So when you disconnect a person that doesn't have any rights in this country, that doesn't have, that there's a language barrier with, that doesn't know their rights, that has a lack of education, that is completely naive and unaware of our culture, our standards, our laws, etc. They, that, that, I mean, that ground is ripe for exploitation. Yes, even from the very people claiming that they are here to protect these folks. And unless they have made some fail-safe protection to make sure that that kind of thing doesn't happen to the people that they're apparently smuggling into this country illegally in, in order to help them file for asylum, in order to help them stay here and possibly get asylum and or... Um, you know, be deported after getting a chance to work here for a year. Um, there are going to be stories, horror stories of people being trafficked, abused, assaulted, possibly even killed. You're going to hear about that. And I'm, I'm sad to, to predict what I'm telling you, but I've already seen evidence of it. Bithaya Queen, the leader of the LGBTQIA caravan, last year, started bringing people here illegally from uh from honduras i'm sure i mean she's a a, a, a harvard student i'm sure with the best of intellectual intentions right having studied the the possibilities and the needs and you know it's probably part of her master's thesis or something <laughs> but uh isn't she a doctoral student something something like that yeah but her bringing a person and getting them put into a detention center in the united states 
and and she she brought trans a transgender person uh, over and to hand themselves over into a detention detention facility where she was brutally beaten, and after which she was essentially killed. She died in the custody of Border Patrol. Now, if that woman, and we'll never know because we we won't know. Well, I do know that the folks that are being brought by these caravan coordinators, influencers, politicians, etc., are not telling the caravan the whole truth and nothing but the truth, the full truth. They don't even know it themselves. These people lack the basic knowledge in immigration policy, lack the knowledge of Mexican culture, law, lack the interest in involving Mexico where they are currently squatting, they lack the interest in the background of the caravan's history, their cultures, uh, their country's history in Central America. They lack the basic ability to communicate with these folks in, in Spanish, in their own language. They lack the, the background of knowledge of their religious practices and beliefs. They don't care about them. They don't understand immigration policy. They don't understand migration history. They don't care and they don't understand enough of it to do it without lying, without omissions, and without grave mistakes being made. Like the kind that they made in the Kathleen Bennett case, where they sent an elderly dementia patient to her early grave. Now I understand why they picked her. Now I understand why they picked an elderly person with dementia and her uh, also elderly uh Lakota, Oglala Lakota daughter, because they were vulnerable. And these folks in the organization of this caravan are looking for, are targeting, are they're cultivating from the inception of the caravans back in Central America, people who are vulnerable. Watch as people like Mark Lane, the producer for TYT, says that he latched on to somebody that had Down syndrome all the way back in Guatemala, all the way back where they were starting the caravan. There were people that are connected to Mark Lane that have been following the caravan and specifically focusing on that child with Down syndrome, on the girl in the wheelchair, right? On the pe what did I show you about the disaster vultures in, in Puerto Rico? They focused on the people with cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. They pe they focus on the most vulnerable people because they can manipulate your emotions with that. And they know it. And you know what else these folks know? And you know what else these folks are selling? Their followers. That's you. All of the people that followed them all the way back going to Standing Rock, you're just a commodity to them that they can sell to the highest bidder. Somebody's political party, somebody's media platform, somebody's latest uh, grab for power. And what's happening right now in America is that the immigration issue is, according to polls, the most important one to Americans, to politicians. There are billions of dollars to be made if this border wall is uh, funded. Mind, you know, never mind constructed, because that may hmm. never even happen. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. It's all about who wins, who gets the funding, who gets the contracts, and who can use this for political fodder. And the people that use their platforms and give their platforms to whatever the highest bidder in the current crisis is, they know that. They know what you care about. They know they can drag you into this stuff and they know that they can sell you to these people, these campaigns and these issues. Rob Wilson is just one or more of those people mm -hmm. making money off of his following. Oh yeah. But he's also using the background that he has as a, as a Marine in, from the military and of course he took his, I think his brothers in the army uh he took his brother and his sister to standing rock all of them are photographers and journalists and i also think that they have other skills because check out this other video i mean the video you just watched of rob wilson he goes right up to the police mm -hmm. and he's narrating the whole time there's a whole bunch of police i i think they're gonna raid the warehouse at yeah. any moment so he's 
he's you know signaling to his viewers listeners and to the organizers inside this warehouse eminent threat Mm -hmm. he's communicating directly to them in video form what's happening all the way around the perimeter Hmm. talk about you know security cameras exactly they've got walking security in the form of these journalists that the Mm -hmm. cops are supposed to find untouchable right yeah he goes right up to the police and says hey What's happening here in English? As yeah. if the cops are there to answer his questions. Mm-hmm. And the cop says to him in Spanish, are you drunk? Have you been drinking? <laughs> and then he says, identify yourself. And Rob Wilson suddenly acts like he has no clue what's going on. And he says, I don't speak English. And then Spanish. he realizes he just made a mistake and says again, after the officer repeats his command to identify himself I don't speak Spanish. Like, <laughs> I'm not understanding that you need me to commu- you know, <clears throat> ID myself and show you who I am. Yep. So he keeps playing stupid, and the cop tells him to get the hell out of there. Yep. Basically tells him to get out, hmm. to leave. So he leaves, so he does understand. He knows. Yeah. And he's like, okay, imminent uh, raid on the uh, warehouse. So... In this next video, you're going to see how he is continuing to do reconnaissance. Video two. Police officers here. Municipal and federal. Outside of the Benito Juarez Stadium, about a block away, half a block from the warehouse where the refugee center is, there's a line of police, municipal and federal. Um, Looks like the raid may not have happened yet, but we're just walking by right now. We're about a block away. There's a line ahead of us. There's a line ahead of us. Looks like there's there's a lot of riot police. safe distance. Okay. So it's not really showing up very well, but there's about Probably close to a hundred riot police <laughs> stage in a two block area. All shields, helmets, batons, full gear. of the people that were out on the street out of there oh yeah i got rid of them yeah and one of the reasons that they were able to do is because the riot police (coughs) were prepared they are aware that there are organizers that are kind of manipulating these caravan goers so and they were already in that warehouse the warehouse was granted to them after they refused to stop occupying the street illegally and so they gave in to their demands that they be given access to a shelter that was closer to where they already were. So they got them a warehouse, which they rented for them at uh, 50 feet from their location. 50 yards. 50 or yards. Meters, actually. 50 meters from where they mm-hmm. were, camped out on the street. But that wasn't enough either because there was hundreds of them that still remain on the street that refused to go to 50 feet, you know, 50 meters away from from that location, they wanted to continue to occupy the street. What I told you before is that the officials there learned that many of these folks refused to go to the government-run shelter at El Barretal and to the warehouse that was open just 50 uh, feet away from them or meters away from them, not because of all of the excuses that they gave, but because they are they have vices because mm-hmm. they are addicts of some kind and and because of that addiction 
they aren't able to follow the rules at anywhere, right? That's a problem. Um, so that's something that, that these folks are not telling you. Another thing that these folks are not telling you that you will not hear in the regular media as they're announcing that, oh, no, the warehouse that they're in is going to get shut down. They're going to get raided. Mm -hmm. They're not telling you that the agreement that these folks uh, leave the street was that they were going to be granted an area, a shelter in the vicinity, right, as close as possible to where they were already camped out in the street for one month. Not forever and ever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. They were going to get rented for one month. About the amount of time, the approximate amount of time that the other shelter was going to be given to remain open. And why is that? Because all of these people have been processed for humanitarian visas. Those that wanted them. Those that did not want them. They could decide to get deported back to their countries. To go back to their countries of their own accord or to find a way to cross into the United States uh, illegally or however they, you know, however they have God's understanding to do it. But you can't just remain an indigent at, at, at the expectation that the, the Mexican government will house you indefinitely and feed you indefinitely mm -hmm. for free. That's crazy. The fact that they did what they did in the amount of time that they did is miraculous in and of itself. The Mexican government in one city with very limited resources was able to open up two, count them, two shelters, three shelters if you count the original one mm -hmm. at Benito Juarez for these folks, provide food and resources, medical and the like for all of these folks and process their claims for a uh, you know, humanitarian visa in record time such that they would not only have the humanitarian visa in hand, they would have weeks in which to work with that visa while staying at the shelter for free and continuing to stay and eat there for free until they could get enough money together to rent a place. You know what some of them did in the past? You know what some of them did right at the very beginning of all of this? Within one week. No kidding. We talked about it here on my show. Within one week of their arrival in Tijuana, there are groups of people that I talked to you about that were being interviewed by Alfredo Alvarez that had already gotten their humanitarian visas, were in a group renting a location where they were all staying together, probably because they hadn't made enough money mm -hmm. yet to be able to afford their own places. So they rent him, rented a spot in a group of, you know, families or, or people. And they were already selling food to the caravan goers. They put, you know, they started a little business selling food to the caravan goers and they were making money the first week after their arrival. So for people who are at El Barretal and for the folks that are organizing them, coordinating them and manipulating the message and the propaganda around what's really happening there, to be saying that they're being thrown out on the street, they have nowhere to go, they have no pos prospects for what they're going to do, is simply untrue. They have had weeks, nay, months at this point to find a job, to look for a place to live, and to disperse throughout the country or move along into the United States if that's what their dream was. Some of them came to realize, thousands of them came to realize that what they were told when they were artificially gathered together and lied to about their prospects of the American dream and being able to come into this country, when they realized it, they decided they wanted to go home. In fact, many of them who have been interviewed recently, who have been interviewed throughout this process about whether or not they've applied for the humanitarian visa, whether or not they already have it, and why they're not working even though thousands of them have humanitarian visas and have chosen not to work is. And their answer is surprising. Their answer is simply this. The impira, which is the form of money in Honduras, is almost at the same level as the Mexican peso. 
why would I want to work to earn pesos when they're at the same level as the impida? Why would I travel thousands of miles for that? I could have stayed back in Honduras to earn that kind of money. I came to earn dollars. So they're very, they're, you know, quite literally saying if I can't earn in dollars, if I can't earn this wage level, I won't work. I refuse to work. And there are others still that have the most ridiculous of excuses, including that they were waiting for the new year. They're waiting for their bodies to recover from the long walk, which we know they didn't walk all the way. We now know mm -hmm. many of them were offered transport along the way. They did not walk for 40 days, no matter what these activists are telling you. It's simply not true. And I'm not ever the, the type of person to try to diminish the, the, the long and arduous path that it takes migrants to cross um, or, or how brutal the conditions are. So you have a group of people running reconnaissance, giving information back to the people in the ca caravan and basically also giving them orders, just like they were given orders to lock down or go on marches or do things at Standing Rock that led to violent clashes with police and authorities. So will this caravan. Here you see that there is uh, a video from the, I'm not going to show the Exodo video. Okay. I'm just going to tell people what is in the Exodo video because it's in Spanish. Um, I can put it on. You have the sound down. You can talk a little bit. Yeah, you could. This is a video from the group, the uh, Migrant Exodus that ja Salva, what's her name? Gosh. Sandoval, Jesse Sandoval was um, hanging out with the Ulises guy. Mm -hmm. Remember she was talking about how that woman yeah. came, Eva Hernandez, yep. the, mm -hmm. the lady that ran for president in Honduras, mm -hmm. that um, she came to the, the Barretal and she's a, she's a paid worker of the dictator in Honduras and they let her in and she was giving orders to people. This is the guy that was in the video talking about her. Okay. And they started their own platform, the Pueblo Exodo. Oh, yeah. So now they're doing media from that platform. And he was walking around asking these folks whether they have the, their humanitarian visa and whether or not they're working. And many of them are saying that, no, they're not going to work. Uh, there's no point in working. Mm -hmm. um, they, they get This lady, for example, gives the excuse that she has to stay at the shelter every day to help the shelter yeah. people to, yeah, she, to yeah, she's volunteering to, to volunteer in the shelter up. to you know help manage donations help uh, uh, keep the place tidy all of that mm -hmm. when you know the shelter has government workers that go around and clean up yeah and that manage and run the shelter so yeah they're expected to try and help do all of that but uh, as I we have shown in the media from uh, Tijuana from all over Mexico, these uh, caravan goers have left a lot to be desired in terms of cleanliness along their way. Mm -hmm. They've left places yeah. torn down and disgusting, really. Mm -hmm. And these other interviews that he does, you know, um, continue to ask the same question. He keeps telling everybody at this shelter, hey, did you know they're going to shut this shelter down mm -hmm. uh, around the 15th? Of January where will you go and they all say well I'll be homeless I'll be on the streets yep. if they kick me out of here he also asks them if they have jobs and they're like no are you looking for one now why would I look for a job so it's it's it boggles the mind for anyone from any country anywhere to hear the the uh, the cojones with which these people from the caravan mm -hmm. that are here um, well, they're in Mexico right now. Some of yeah. them are here mm -hmm. um, w with their hand out, mm -hmm. making a request for humanitarian aid and, and humanitarian support while they're making demands with a club in one hand and with their hand held out on yeah. the other hand. Yeah, exactly. Well, you can tell, too, that... Um, as people, people talk and they um, kind of explain themselves and they explain their expectations and what they were told, that they were, they were giving this, these false pretenses 
of what they were going to achieve by participating in this. And this is, this is a massive undertaking of people to get that many people across several countries. But people are kind of holding their ground at, I'm going to get in the United States and get asylum. And as we've said in previous shows, not that we like it, not that it's a, you know, it's a good thing, but the way asylum is, is dealt with in the United States, it's very rare to actually achieve. It's very rare to get. And the documentation you need and the danger you need to be in to meet that criteria, and it's not quick. So this idea that you can sit in the shelter in uh, Tawana and then, you know, all of a sudden be able to enter the United States and then be granted asylum and have everything you need, that was a false hope, a false pretense that these people were promised. And, you know, and thousands of people actually aren't there anymore. You know, the people realize that, oh, I know what's happening here. None of the stuff I came here for is really going to happen, and they figure out what else to do. And yet there's a whole bunch of people that are still hanging out along the border wall, waiting for their next directions, you know, and waiting for more people, waiting for reinforcements, because they have to, they have to maintain that um, imagery on the border for all these groups that are raising money off of them. Sure. And, you know, folks have been asking me this question over and over again, Duke. They're like, Cindy... Who do you trust? Is there anybody that can be trusted? Is there... Here's a better question, folks. Ask yourself this. Can everyone be corrupted? Can everyone be co-opted? Can everyone be bought out? The answer is, yeah, a lot of people can be. And here's something else that you have to take into account. People can also be tricked or taken along for the ride. You know... Media influencers have really changed the landscape in terms of advertising, uh, viewership, celebrity, etc. I mean, they've changed the entire landscape of what that looks like in America. And it's worth mentioning because we're talking about media influence and propaganda. So how do these folks that I'm talking about, these influencers, these political animals, these organizers fit into this well uh they depend on celebrity and media just as much as anyone else in the past has but that is now a different looking animal you don't you can't just go to uh you know a mark ruffalo and 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 then have them have their millions of followers um simply lash on to an issue although they're going to use Mark Ruffalo's too. They're going to use the Hollywood people too. But guess what? There are people that are doing YouTube videos. They have YouTube video channels where they play video games or react to foods or all sorts of crazy things. They have people doing makeup tutorial videos on YouTube that have just as many comedians, mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of people doing prank videos that have just as many millions of followers on WhatsApp, on Instagram, on Vines, they're no longer around, on Pin, you know, and that matters. Guess what happened on Facebook? Followers, pages, live streaming, right? Mm -hmm. All of these different platforms, through the through the length of their life, you know, some things die and and go away, like MySpace. Yeah, I had a MySpace account. Oh yeah, everybody had a MySpace account before, but when Facebook came around, people were like, "Oh, this platform is way better, so let's go over here." Mm -hmm. Who knows how long Facebook will be around? Like right now, you might not be able to even fathom the idea that one day Facebook will be obsolete, and we'll look back and go, "Oh my God." Do you imagine, can you imagine how much time we wasted on that? But for the time being, when this platform took off, media savvy, intelligent people knew they were going to be people that were going to gain thousands or even millions of followers and that they were going to be influencers. So they made sure to cultivate them mm -hmm. themselves. They sent people like Rob Wilson there. After he had cut his teeth on some other campaign for Black Lives Matter or something else, just like many of the other photographers and documentarians, etc., that they sent there, they weren't real photographers. They didn't have a, a background in in documentary films. 
I can't. I still can't find a single one that the French guy Simbad, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Rumni, whatever, mm-hmm. Guggenheim, Guggenheim guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I still can't find one. But it mm-hmm. doesn't matter. This is where they're going to have their origin story. It doesn't matter that you have people like uh, Ocasio Cortez that didn't have any kind of real political history or resume. She had an origin story at Standing Rock, right? These places, these events, and these new media platforms that that are being opened up were going to be the birthplaces of influencers. And these folks made sure to cultivate them from the beginning and to incorporate them into their media packages. PR people like Winnie Wong, mm-hmm. like Seven McDonald's, Maggie uh, um, Day, that were hired by uh, you know politicians and their sons like West Cl- General Wesley Clark and um, Wes Clark Jr. and the TYT team that are media producers that are poli- that, that run political candidates like Justice Democrat candidate Ocasio Cortez and Ilan Omar. All of these people that were working with Bernie Sanders, that were working with Francis Fisher, that were working with these Hollywood people. They also have a wide variety of media influencers, live streamers, YouTubers in their pockets, in their toolkit. And the people that they cultivated that came out of Standing Rock, which they rubbed up against their real Hollywood people like Shailene Woodley and Mm -hmm. Mark Ruffalo and Francis Fisher and Jane Fonda. They rubbed these new media influencers, they're like, here, Myron Dewey, rub up against on Mark Ruffalo. Yeah. Now you're a media influence too. Fly, <clears throat> fly. And some of them did fly. Some of them were flying, like the Truth Against the Machine and Chelsea Lyons Kent. And then they raped people and they went splat. And so did their platform. Right? So some of these things are going to have some longevity, some legs. They're going to be able to create their own You know, they're going to be able to create their own mystique, their own platform to be used by others. Some of them are going to die in the process, but they are going to milk them for every penny in the meantime. Yes Magazine is one of those publications that has been running. I've seen, and, and and I'm not saying that this is a tried and true set in stone Mm -hmm. trend, but I, I am noticing it. Yes Magazine has published a lot of the phonies that we saw out of Standing Rock. And Yes Magazine has also, uh, not just Yes Magazine, excuse me, um, Teen Vogue also has had carried a lot of the articles of these activists. This is Rob Wilson posting in Yes Magazine. You see this? Mm -hmm. That's him right there. Wow. And this is a photo album that he put out. And the story, he's featuring certain activists certain media people that are part of this campaign uh of helping people that are in this refugee camp and what it's like to be part of this refugee uh group and he features some some of the people that are taking them uh, volunteers from the border angels of course we know the border angels are working with al otro lado and some of the people that i told you are associated with their defense and guess who's in this too Uh why it's Dwayne redwater a lakota from south dakota what are the odds that they would meet each other (laughs) at this at this place with thousands and thousands of people and guess who else is in this story why it's none other than weaka eagleman Mm -hmm. chicago lakota he also just happened to run into rob wilson and be featured in yes magazine yeah and who else have they placed prominently in the ah. media? Well, it's Lorenzo Serna of Unicorn Riot, which I told you has been one of the you know propaganda arms of these movements on the left, um, having to do with pipelines, having to do with uh, Antifa, having to do with uh, Black Lives Matter, etc. They have been more than happy to run the propaganda from the left as is untested. Uh, And as I told you, I went to people um, within these groups and organizations that were formed at Standing Rock to tell them about a person that they had allowed it to fall through the cracks. I would say pushed through the cracks. Mary Trujillo and Kathleen Bennett. 
so that they could right the wrong on the criminal activity that they were involved with on the lying to the police on the uh, putting the uh, innocent person in a jail for six months on letting her grandmother or letting her mother slowly uh, lose her ability to ambulate and begin to die and die an early death because of what they did to her in that hospital and people like Unicorn Riot people like TYT they were more than happy to not only tell us to take a, a leap ignore the story yep. but they also made sure that they were um, there to uh, help cover stories of the people that falsely accused Kathleen Bennett. So they are definitely putting forth an agenda. This yeah. is not the only place Rob Wilson is disseminating his particular take on all of this. Here also is the uh, Wilson caravan lockdown post he, where he is signaling, he says, I'm hearing reports. You were generating the reports. Yeah. Rob, you were generating the information and the reconnaissance information from outside, the security information from outside to let the people inside of that warehouse know that it was time to lock <clears throat> themselves down. Then you took a position on a roof and told the story of how there, there are new reports that the migrants inside of the warehouse locked themselves down in order to prevent the riot police from conducting a raid and removing them to the other shelter. Yeah. You know why they have to remove them, Duke? Because they were given one month. That was the time frame and the agreed upon payment for the rental. Mm -hmm. They now claim inside the warehouse that they were they were told and or that they they uh, need Personally, they need to stay at this location until January 24th, and um, that's what they are going to do. When, when asked by reporters today where they will go once the January 24th deadline comes and goes, they said, you tell us, where will we go? Yeah, we yeah. have nowhere to go. So I don't think that these folks want to leave at any time mm -hmm. or any date. I think that they want to continue to be supported financially um fed yeah every day and taken care of without having to work or you know correct their legal status anywhere mm -hmm. they simply don't they want to be an occupying force that doesn't do anything or move on with their life or you know go in go into society and participate in any way rob wilson is al also putting forth the ecate um society uh information he says to on the 29th to everyone for the support and continued attention to the ongoing humanitarian crisis thank you love you all and he posts a press release from the ecate society hmm. which is basically his it's got his photo in it yeah but he is also promoting what is within this news release which is information that basically says that they're going to be forcefully removed by the police mm -hmm. that they're being threatened that they're in danger yeah. when in fact they are squatting yeah. in a place they were told they could only be rented out for one month that time has now elapsed and they refuse to go to the other remaining own open shelter trying to force that the um you know if you don't pay if you're still there in a place where that your rental is due and up, <clears throat> you're going to have to pay for another whole month, right? Unless they let you do a day-to-day -day kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're trying to force this kind of a situation onto the authorities that rented this facility for them so that they can continue to remain there for longer and longer periods of time. Hmm. It's... Uh, pretty messed up how yeah. they're going about doing this and of course they're messaging as if they are the ones that are the victims mm -hmm. when they're pushing for this illegal thing to happen just like the flint flop house squatters mm -hmm. went into a house in flint michigan and stayed there and then took off and didn't pay the rent yeah so that they left the the homeowners with a three thousand dollar bill after they left these folks are doing the same thing to the Mexican people, the Mexican government, and they're making demands that these 
extreme positions of theirs be, um, you know, given into yeah. when there already exists another shelter where they could fit mm-hmm. all of them mm-hmm. at once. But no, these people want two different places to be rented at mm-hmm. once just because they don't like the other one. Yeah. It's a it's a load of hogwash. Mm-hmm. And I, I could not understand why the government in Mexico uh, bend, bent to their whim. But I think that with all of the social pressure and international uh, media attention that this story is getting, they wanted to treat this whole situation with kid gloves in order to show their sensitivity to migrant issues and to show their compassion for migrants in general. Mm-hmm. I feel, though, it lays very bare all of this nonsense that these folks are literally acting like a child throwing a tantrum and then pretending to be the victims of their own uh, ignorant and um, childish behavior. It's also the worst possible way to treat your hosts who you are taking advantage of. It is very clear that you are taking advantage of the people of Tijuana and of the people of Mexico. So beware because the folks there are on to you. They've seen that, you know, what you claim that you're just peacefully going to march to the, the, the uh, wall isn't true. That what you say that you just you just want to stay close to the border wall. So if they get you a warehouse, you'll unoccupy this. You'll open the street isn't true. That all of the, the things that you claim are excuses for why you can't get a, a job just yet or you don't want to start working right now aren't true you have another agenda one that you can't talk about because it would make very clear that you're not a refugee you're an activist you're an occupier and you're here to wreak havoc you're here to cause violent clashes at the border with military and with uh, border patrol and with the mexican authority authorities in mexico right now um so here's the Hecate Society article. I'll share the link in the comments below so you can check it out for yourself. This is their page. And it says, Honduran migrants and refugees suffer terribly in Tijuana jails. Posted mm-hmm. December 28th by Hecate Society. Mm-hmm. They claim that the person that went into the jail that is talked about or that is uh, anonymously featured in this story is a Spanish speaking American. So how many Spanish speaking Americans amongst this group of organizers and influencers do we know of? Uh, One that are women. One maybe because this is a woman. Yep. Yep. Only, only a couple, a couple, couple, only a couple of them that I know of. I think I, I think I, that, that the person that <clears throat> is uh, in this article might be Jesse Sandoval. Yeah, I'm think not so sure. Too. It's an anonymous person, so mm-hmm. we won't know. And plus the article, look at the photo who is by. It's Rob, Rob Wilson. Rob Wilson Photography. Yep. Rob Wilson Photography is involved with that. So just look at all of the different pies and the propaganda that these people are pushing and how they're pushing it. I'm not going to go through that whole article, but it does try to paint a bleak picture of how the police are treating people Mm -hmm. of how the police are treating activists and how the police are treating people in their jails if you don't want to go to a mexican jail you might not want to go through mexico and you certainly don't want to appear to be a militant activist making demands of the mexican government yeah when you have no right to do so Mm -hmm. because they don't put up with that nonsense and they certainly don't put up with it for long um, the entitled attitude with which these folks have entered the country makes them appear to believe that they can do what they want and how they want. For many of them, this is an opportunity to disaster tourism mm-hmm. and party, party, hmm. have a good time. I mean, like that uh, Jonathan Fritzler in uh, Puerto Rico was saying, we want to do good. We want to help people and make money at it right Mm -hmm. that's right you can make money at it so they want fame they want fortune and if in the process they do something good well hell all the better right um one of those people that really likes to push the envelope talking frequently about the deaths of the two children 
crying into the camera and as of most recently saying that he literally feels like he was with that boy hmm. he's he was just with him recently and and uh now he's dead wow and he was never near that boy and he was never <laughs> near the girl that died either because they weren't part of the caravan but adam Elfers speaks of both of these kids as if they were and as if he had been with them developed a relationship to them and was now mourning their deaths as if they were his own children yep and it was his experience yes that's how they talk about this go check out their pages you could see for yourself mm -hmm. but here is uh what they're up to right now they're um trying to get instruments because yeah, that's exactly what people in the caravan need yep, right now. That's right. They need a bunch of instruments so they can turn this into Lollapalooza or something. Yep. Can you read that for me, honey? Yes. This is at Adam Elfers. Need help? Comment on this post if you live in San Diego or know someone that does. We need to store musical instruments somewhere to take to Mexico for the kids and families. For the kids and families seeking asylum, stuck in shelters at the border. Many have been reaching out to me with the same idea. The vision is to hand deliver between 50 and 100 instruments and let them know people in the USA are sending love and through music, we will. <clears throat> we need donations in San Diego to ship and store instruments over the next few weeks. You'll be part of something amazing. We'll document this project and inspire many people. Music and love is a common language. Please tag and share this. Let's show the world the USA is not full of hate. Let's build a bridge of love through music. Take friends near San Diego and write to me today and get involved. Who has a place where we can store the in instruments to deliver? Through music, love has no borders. Can you help us? With Kel Carismoto and Lolly B. Uh, oh, man. I've seen this guy. Yeah. Well... I've also heard him singing. Yeah, he's a figure. Trying to sing in Spanish. And, uh, ew, I'm sorry. It's yeah. pretty awful. Also, all he sings is Si Se Puede. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he heard Obama say it once, and he's like, I know Spanish now. Uh -huh. And that's all he will repeat. It's so condescending and gross. And so is Lolly B, otherwise known as Laura Christina Livingston Berger. So Adam Elfers is out to get some instruments because that's what the caravan needs right yeah, now. Right. They need a band. Yeah, give him a big tuba, you know, lug this around. Yeah. Um, and then he started posting in Asylum Seekers about New Year's. Here's what he had to say about his um, New Year's... Uh, Feelings. Seeker. Yeah. It's Happy New Year, familia. Feliz Nuevo Año. It's Año Nuevo, pendejo. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> if he's going to speak in Spanish, I'm going to Got to put him in the right order. Of the hundreds of New Year's pictures I saw last night, to me, none was more inspiring than this one. No sport coats, no chandeliers, no colored glasses or plastic hats. Just five guys in one dream. These are my friends from Honduras. You heard about them. They walked over 40 days and 3,000 miles to apply for asylum in the United States. Did if, they? No. They, that would have been 75 miles a day. They would have been walking walking um, five miles an hour. It would be like 18 hours a day of a pretty fast-paced walking. So There's no way. There's no and way. they arrived in the There's, border. Their shoes would be worn out quickly. They yeah, they arrived at the border so quickly. They're, they they had to have been driven parts of oh, that yeah, route. Oh, yeah, definitely. And if you ask me... Though as yet, they've been met with closed borders, hate speech, and denial of their basic human rights. I've never seen a crisper, more timeless picture of five American heroes than this. But so, they're not American. So on behalf of my brothers and every soul who sets out across the long, dark night, chasing that shining star of freedom above barbed wire, barricades, militarized walls, tear gas and rubber bullets, fireworks, <coughs> and all the gossip, Happy New Year, New Year, because it's 2019... Love knows no borders. These are the faces of my American heroes. Let's make this day a history. Let's make 2009 a year of love and dis diversity. Share this message. Start off right. We, we, hashtag build a bridge. Happy New Year. Nuevo Año. American heroes. Build a bridge. Okay, now go to the next one. There's more. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, this is the second. 
this oh, is oh, the picture. The, just, these are the pictures. This of the, is the American this heroes. This is American heroes. Mm -hmm. These are five guys at the so, Barretal. And this is share this to start 2019. They look right. like the people that were part of the posts where they were going to the pizza place. Yeah. Remember? Like, they mm -hmm. look familiar. Like the ones that went to the house. They look like they're dressed pretty nice. I mean, is that guy wearing jewelry? He's got a nice little chain there going on on his neck. Yep. I mean, they look like they're sporting some, you know, mm -hmm. nice clothes, nice hats. Uh, they they were recently, it looks like this is some of the same guys that went to the house that were playing pool. Mm -hmm. Remember Adam says, these yeah, are that's my right. friend. They, and, my and friend pizza. took these guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of them get some special treatment and end up even being called heroes. So yeah. there's definitely an agenda here to push how we're supposed to see these folks. But I think that we're not getting a clear view of what's really going on. So what what else is going on behind the scenes? Well, there's a walk run thing that's happening. And this um, woman whose uh, name I don't know, she goes by the Facebook uh, name Ma Ingan Ikwe. Yeah. And she, if you will recall, was one of the people that we saw with disaster vultures in Puerto Rico at Higgins, Anthony Gazzotti, mm -hmm. all those folks out there with the Boondock K9 unit. Remember those nonprofit organizations yeah. that we told you were defunct and or they weren't nonprofits? That these folks were working on where they had uncertified dogs and people mm -hmm. that people that didn't have any training in emergency assistance running hospitals yeah. and helping people whose homes had been destroyed by a hurricane maria mm -hmm. well she is now headed to this walk run thing and here's uh her post about it saying that she is going to be in this event, January 29th, and that she's going to give some more details. And she also needs your support, meaning your dollars, yeah. because she has a lot of driving to do and she's got to pick up people and she's got to go do all of this because it's going to help the people on the border in the caravans. Here's a little clip of her video. Oh, good morning. We got quite a few people on here. Mary, Rachel, mm -hmm. Robert. Deb, G, good to see you guys. Jolly, good morning. Rhonda, good morning. Um, Mary, good morning to you both, she says. Good, good morning, morning, Mary. Lisa, Lucy, Carrie, good morning. Okie dokie then. So, as you guys know, we are going to pick up our friend Dave Critter, who invited us to go down to the Unity Walk. I think that's so cool. The Unity nice. Walk and Run down at the border. Um, this walk and run is about um, about saying no to the border pipeline. It's going to be going through right through the, the butter wall. the border wall. We still use the pipeline. It's in the morning, <laughs> <laughs> so it's about the border wall to stop the construction um, that's that's going through there. So there's going to be people on the Mexico side over here. Now what they've asked us to do is on our way down to Texas once we pick up Dave is to pass out flyers to stop in as many towns as we can to help get supplies to spread the word um, because this is planning to be one of the biggest walks and I think that's awesome like I just need a megaphone <laughs> so this is one of the people that you saw, you know, working uh, hand in hand with the folks that were out in Puerto Rico, including the people that were the investors in this Bitcoin stuff and this all, you know, remember that, that whole uh, group of people that were, um, you know, Bitcoin investors oh, like yeah, yeah. and stuff in, that in were Puerto Rico there, and impact investing. Oh and, yes, yes. Right. So this is the same group of people. She starts off by saying, Oh, this is about a pipeline where we're, she forgot what lie she was peddling today. So she was saying, this is to say no to the border pipeline. Yep. And somebody <laughs> had to correct her off, off camera. No, remember, she we're talking the about wall. the border wall. She's like, oops, wrong lie. Yeah. Because as you know, the pipeline in the Dakota Access uh, protest was built. 
In fact, if you ask me, it got built even faster after the protesters got there. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And it was protected along its route, probably by some of these infiltrators, especially those working hand in hand with the media. Um, and there is a, a poster to go along with this prayer walk run. This one is the Unity Has No Borders prayer walk and run. And it says that they're going to be doing this along the area where the Mission Texas uh, Sanctuary for the Butterflies oh, okay. is at, that they're going to construct the, the wall through. And uh, they're going to try and stop that. I see. My guess is they're not going to really stop anything, but they're definitely going to take your money while they try. That's right. They're not really going to try, though. <laughs> but they're going to take your money and pretend that they were trying. And, you know, this... Um, uh, it, this is this person is also connected to Myron Dewey's a pal and person that was also uh, broadcasting through the digital smoke signals platform, Dave Gaskin. You remember him? Oh yeah. Um, he was in Tijuana. He's posting about this as well. He says they got to stop the construction of this uh, wall through the Ya Louis Butterfly Village in Mission, Texas. No wall on tribal lands, they say. Yeah. Just like they were saying, no pipelines on tribal lands. Mm -hmm. But where did it get them? Well, and they're talking about what they're going to do. So he says, we are walking from Tijuana to, can you read the rest of that for me? Well, as Mexico and another group of walkers and runners are leaving from Mission. Here, let me make this a little bit bigger. Another group of walkers and runners are leaving from Mission, Texas to El Paso, where we'll meet up with my cousin Dave Critter and Juan B. Mancias, jam out, and have a ceremony. We do have a route listed for our stop, so if you want to meet up with us, hit some miles and let us know. See, miigwech, everyone. And Unity Has No Borders photo and photos of, I don't know who. Mm-hmm, 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 mm -hmm. And of course, Gaskin. Dave Dave Critters is one of the people that appears in this uh, Mi Egan or whatever her name is, Mi yeah. Nangan, <laughs> the yes. woman from Puerto yeah. Rico, the woman that was at Standing Rock, the woman that's been in a lot of these pipeline uh, protest things. Um, she uh, and Gaskin are promoting the same event and they're working with the same people. They've been working within these groups, within the same people. This shows you a little bit more about what I mean. This is Dave Gaskin, and he's tagged with Lad Mama LaDonna from right. Standing Rock, yeah, one of the that. prime instigators of that camp starting that called so many people out there and only to strand them on her land that wasn't really hers to have this um, protest camp on. And how many other people? 30 people. So why don't you read that for us, Duke? All right. It's all right. I was wondering how far it is from Tijuana to Juarez. My brother from Europe is going to walk the entire route from Tijuana to Juarez with us now. Hoa. People from the four directions walking the U.S. and Mexico border meeting in the four directions. Another brother, Dave Critter, is bringing the Eagle Quetzal Condor Unity Drum from Dennis Banks' house after having a ceremony in Bemidji, Minnesota. We all meet at the wall in El Paso and Juarez and do a unity ceremony and hold talk, talking circles for everyone to address the border wall construction and other issues in communities through native lands. Tomorrow at 1 p.m. we are having a gathering at our brother Sergio's restaurant with some Aztec relatives and then heading to the beach and border wall to do a water prayer and ask our creator for a safe and successful walk to bring awareness to the border wall construction going on through the Yalu Butterfly Village in Mission, Texas. We can't let them destroy our sacred spaces for corporate or political interests. Borders aren't real on native lands. They are the stewards of our sacred mother earth. Now let's Unite and act like it. Anyone wants to help me or join me, please let me know. 
Uh, Chi McWetch, everyone, Mexico's Life, Equal Condor, Unite Our Family, Equal Condor Caravan, Unity Has No Borders, Walk Run, Unity Has No Borders, and then here's the Unity Has No Borders poster that he put in there. And uh, we're all on. There's some, oh, Jesse Sandoval chimes in. I wish every, even more communication and information could happen about these beautiful events and actions with the folks inside the migrant caravan. The education and history sharing needs to happen both ways. The Condor people have much wisdom to impart. Oh, I didn't get it fully expanded. Anyway, uh, keep reading. David Gaskin says, get in there and pass the word on. And, and Jesse says, says, what's the word? What do I tell them? Every day I get calls and texts from my migrant compass, compass. compass in Tijuana tell me that they need housing, shelter, and legal support and adva advice. To navigate to make sense of the Mexican immigration effery. effery. I have one Honduran compañero who has recently denied his Mexican humanitarian visa because he's been too outspoken about the human rights violations inside the Baratal, even though he had been promised a visa by the Mexican government. Mm. Go ahead and finish reading that. They part. don't know where they're going to go after Baratal shuts down after January. Not everyone has jobs yet or housing. 2,000 people still at Benatel, and another caravan coming out of Honduras in mid-January, coming towards Tijuana. Okay, now let me stop you there. Go back to that post, the whole thing. Okay, I want to I want to comment on what Jesse Sandoval has okay. said here, okay? All right. And <clears throat> I find it interesting when they have these kinds of back and forths where they're kind of disagreeing with each other because this is a huge network of people working with each other and it includes people from the media like Mark Lane and TYT uh, and, and uh, Rob Wilson Photography and Digital Smoke Signals as a platform and the Asylum Seekers Caravan Support Network. And they seem to have, uh, you know, different, different functioning parts and different leaders or different agendas, uh, what have you. However... They are associating themselves with people they have either grossly misjudged or uh, very poorly researched because if they had paid attention even, um, you know, tangentially to what the media organizations that they are working for um, have done in the past or are doing with regard to indigenous issues, with regard to these specific same people involved in activ mm -hmm. in activism and media work, etc., going to Tijuana, they would want nothing to do with them. They wouldn't want their names associated with any of these folks because of what they have done in the past and what they are still continuing to do. So the lack of judgment, if they don't know, they will know or they should know. Maybe somebody will tag them in my show and they'll watch it and they'll go, oh my God. Look at all of the things wrong with these folks I'm working mm -hmm. with that are, you know, maybe I should work independently of these other organizations and groups because I don't want to be associated with people that are associated with criminal activities. I don't want to be associated with, uh, for example, uh, TYT shutting down and hiding a story of a woman that was framed by people mm -hmm. working around, you know, with closely with TYT. Like Wes Clark. Yep. Right? So we know that these folks, they they knew, they ought to know, they will know eventually and hopefully do something. Because if they know, if they don't, if all they do is go kicking and screaming, dragging their feet, it's because they want to work with these folks. They don't really care what these folks has done. And they're in it to win it just like they are. They're here for the money, the power, the fame, the fortune, or the cookie. Or the cookie or all of those things at the end of the day it doesn't really matter to me what I want to understand is why they continue to do what they are doing even though it's hurting folks and let me show you some of the tags on this post so you can see it's not just uh, the, the stuff from the past it's the stuff from this present I'm gonna show you some tags on this post in a minute but let me just go over some of these things Jesse Sandoval said because I don't know if she is being naive or stupid or both, but here's what bothers me about the way in which she responds back to this 
uh, you know, Gaskin guy telling her, hey, just, just spread the word about the thing that we're doing. And she's like, what are mm-hmm. you talking about? You know what the people really need? They need housing, shelter, legal support, and advice. They need all of this stuff to navigate and make sense of the immigration, Mexican immigration. If you think immig- Mexican immigration is difficult to navigate, yeah, really, Jesse Sandoval, uh, you obviously have no clue how much more difficult American immigration is to navigate. How much more rigid, how much more cruel racist unforgiving it is because y'all didn't mind putting all of these people into the process before as you just admitted in that post you don't have the infrastructure to give them the resources with which to navigate this but you're there to support it right and here's the other thing it says i have one Honduran compañero who's recently denied his mexican humanitarian visa because he's been too outspoken about the human rights violations inside el barretal well So far, we have not been able to, through any resources other than this woman, this lady, Jesse Sandoval, saying that there are human rights abuses that are undocumented, either by her, by the people that she claims are being harmed, or by any other source or authority, okay? There hasn't been any documentation of any kind of human rights abuses at El Barretal. So... I doubt that on the official paperwork for why her compañero was denied his humanitarian visa, it says he was too outspoken about human rights (laughs) abuses that we can't document. (coughs) I'm sure it says something else, probably along the lines of you're here as an illegal um, uh, immigrant in our country. And furthermore, you are agitating to disturb the peace. So you are attempting to uh, interfere with gov- with government functions in our country because guess what that shelter is a government run shelter and you Jesse Sandoval and your compañeros were trying to start some shiz in there you were mm-hmm. trying to get people heated you were trying to demand things from the officials and make demands of how things would be run there along with those folks you were trying to agitate and manipulate and exploit them and one of those people that you got into trouble that you helped get into trouble can now not get their humanitarian visa which everyone is being handed just handed to them right away so that they can stay and work in mexico which means if he can't illegally cross into the united states and soon he's going to get deported Probably because of your instructions. Likely because of your instructions. And you didn't factor that in. Because see, obviously, she didn't care. She Mm -hmm. just wants someone else to fix her screw up. And then it says, it goes on to say, by the way, let me just add one more thing. The Mexican government doesn't owe you a humanitarian visa, especially if you're in their country to wreak havoc to cost them money and to be a problem to the government officials running that shelter. And yes, you have been. You have been misdirecting, misinforming, and manipulating those folks. I've showed it and I showed the proof of what you've been doing with the migrant caravan folks and through your messaging platforms, Jesse Sandoval. I also sent that information to the authorities and the media in Mexico so that they could verify for themselves what you were telling people. You got this person in a situation where they're not going to get a humanitarian visa, probably because of the instructions you gave them. But just to be clear, the government doesn't owe anybody a humanitarian visa. If people are in their country, they can choose, they can decide who they let in and who they go. No, you you seem like you're going to be a problem to the authorities. So we're not going to grant you a visa. Goodbye. And it says they don't know where they're going to go after El Barretal shuts down after January. These aren't puppies that somebody found in a box on a corner. These are full grown human beings. Yes, some of them have children, but these are adults. Yes, there are some unaccompanied minors, not very many, but these are adults. Most of them with the ability to work that have functioning body parts and the ability to work. So unless they're ill, 
uh, uh, you know, unable to walk or move on their own, um, there's a number of opportunities they could have already taken advantage of to work. So, in fact, the Mexican government has set up job fairs and invited these folks so that they could get work. I also have knowledge of the fact and evidence of the fact from the caravan goers themselves that there are people that come to the different shelters on a daily basis with trucks and cars and go, I need five people to come and sweep. I need 10 people to come and move furniture. I need, <clears throat> um, you know, six people to pave my, my driveway. I need, and they, they take them as day laborers. They offer them all of those people there that don't have transportation, don't have a means of going on foot and don't already have a job the ability to work on a daily basis. And many of these folks in the caravan have simply refused to work because they didn't want to. So when this person says to you in this post, a lot of people still don't have jobs. What have you been doing and what believable excuse can you come up with if you have all your faculties and your body is working for why you haven't still been able to get a job and why you won't get one, why these folks refuse to leave a shelter, do they expect to be supported by the Mexican government indeterminably? Because that's not fair. Um, nobody, not even in the United States, especially not in the United States, would allow a bunch of people to stay for months and months and months in a shelter without even attempting to look for work just because they want to stay there to be ready for their organizers to call them to the border to shut it down or to take some other action. So what was the next one we have here? Oh, keep, keep going down that list for a second. I want you to uh, go further down. There's a little bit more here. They continue to have uh, words back and forth with Sandoval and Gaskin. And he says solidarity is a word. Unity is another one. Unite to help ecosystems, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, that's not a translatable aid to people in Tijuana right now. That's poetry for you and I. Our migrant compañeros need more than this poetry and language. They need the things I mentioned to you. Otherwise, it's only useful to one side. Not helpful to those severely impacted right now by the physical proximity to violence, dispossession, and displacement. We need a privacy, excuse me, we need what? To provide solidarity that is not abstract, space and land and advocacy. Otherwise, we are no better than the Catholic missionaries running around, quote, saving souls. Mm -hmm. But you jumped into this anyway without mm -hmm. having the infrastructure <clears throat> to be anything other than Catholic missionaries saving souls. Don't you see that? Yep. Don't you all see that? Gaskin responds. We are doing a walk and run from Tijuana to Juarez, from Mission, Texas to El Paso to oppose the border wall construction, going through the... And how is that going to help migrants? Yeah. Uh, the Butterfly Village Sanctuary in Mission, Texas, and to help with other migrant things. Maybe even Evan <coughs> K. Duke can help you answer what you're looking for. And he tags Evan. He's like, yeah. get this woman off of me, please. That's right. And just Sandoval says, this prophecy is still evolving. We are writing it as we walk. So Let's you are writing it. You're writing the prophecy. Well, then it's not a prophecy. Yeah. Let's make sure we do justice and find ways to truly connect, not protect our ideas without liberation. Project. Pro not project our ideas about liberation onto others without That's exactly first. That's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. Without first listening to folks making the journey north. And he says, I'm not spitting poetry. I'm creating dialogue to have other discussions with possible people who might be interested in helping with what you're talking about. All I can say, I'm not bl blabbing some fairy tale words. I'm yes, explaining you are. You are. what I am doing. No, you're not. You don't realize you really are oh, blabbing fantasy words, fairy tale words. And you really are acting like entitled missionaries. You really are navigating without a compass, without the proper resources. And, you know, what that leads to is people end up getting hurt. People end up falling through the cracks like what happened to Mary Trujillo. And when you have injustices that big, when you have people hurt that badly, I have to question whether or not 
all of the things that you think you're doing are worth it. Because again, there is a pipeline that is running called the Dakota Access Pipeline and it is pumping oil right now. You didn't stop a damn thing. Yeah. You didn't stop any of the other pipelines yet either. I'm wondering what it is out of all these things that you claim to do that you raise all these millions of dollars for that you've actually can produce concrete proof of that you've actually achieved other than getting people elected, other than getting people into office, other than gaining power and followers and raising dollars, which you can't prove that you use on the things that you claim that you're using them for. What concrete policy position thing have you changed? How have you made things better for the people that you claim that you are trying to help? I don't see it. I'm still looking for it. What else does they do they say in that post? So they continue fighting back and forth. Mm -hmm. And please, she says, uh, it's important to do it with folks who are being impacted. But to do this, you must bring more than a metaphor. People need to know you have tangible support that they're listening you're listening to their needs that's a big part of building a horizontal people to people migrant rights liberation movement it's the central american exodus first that's the center and there is an entire history <coughs> attached to this idea of the central american exodus a history that needs to be part of the dialogue you're mentioning and then lilith sinclair jumps into the picture wow and she says for some clarification the efforts are multi tiered we've heard the request for an anonymous shelter and we're exploring land options or large-scale warehouse options ideally for purchase or possibly for rent around close to the border walls possible we're in talks with a couple of different groups on the ground that about this simultaneously some folks in this we are doing this walk to raise awareness for how all of these things are connected Border wall construction and xenophobia relating to Central American rights and government interference relating to the prophecy relating to our intended construction of these permanent villages that activists can move on to the border to provide long-term support to migrants at multiple border points so they're not in a position of coming down, finding short-term housing, and trying to put a band-aid on the keeping wound. Wow. Maybe you shouldn't be disaster traveling and disaster vulturing in all of these places yeah Can you keep going down sure dave critter dave critters yep <clears throat> he's the one that was traveling with that michi egan Ikwe, whatever her name is the puerto rican chick ah. they're the no, she's not puerto rican you know she's the one that was recently in puerto rico okay. disaster vulturing with those oh, i remember those boondocks people and yeah, she's traveling with this Dave Critter right now. They're going to go get the drum. That's the stuff ah, that Dave Gaskins was talking about for the right. walk-run thing. That's right. The drum is coming from Anpo Luta, Luta from Porcupine, South Dakota. The Swallows family starting with ceremony at Dennis Banks' home around 9 p.m. So Dennis Banks is involved in this. Yeah, thing. well, they said they're going to Bemidji to see him. Mm -hmm. And after New Year's, after ceremony, we'll be headed for the drum going to the ceremony. And heading down to Colorado for a ceremony, and maybe a ceremony in New Mexico. Still working out the route and where medicine bundles need to be picked up along the way. And we'll be heading into Texas, meeting the walkers and runners. From that point, we'll have a couple of runners from either side of the border to fill in and join and get us to the border. Why do they write the border like that? I know. Borders, because it's broader. <clears throat> anyway. It's border. Anyway, so we keep we keep hearing about this inserted Indian spirituality into these issues. Why is that important? Well, you know, there's a legacy, there's a history of Native Americans being denied their right to religious expression, right? They have to assimilate, so they've been denied their right to religious expression. And the past uh, wrongs that we have done to the American Indian in this country still weigh heavily upon the hearts and minds and the, you know, the recent uh, history of what we've been doing to Native Americans, including what happened at Standing Rock, what's happened with the uh, college football mascots or football mascots, what's happened with, you know, um, even as recently as Wounded Knee, um, the more recent one. All of those things, Duke. 
they impact how people react to these kinds of issues. So I think part of the reason that this is being artificially inserted is because it's a taboo to mess with and or interfere with their prophecies, their religious uh, rituals. And if they say, hey, we're doing this because it's part of our religious tradition, it's part of our prophecies, you can't mess with it. But honestly, as you saw, Jesse Sandoval, who I think is Puerto Rican, she doesn't know anything about Central Americans or anything about Mexico. Um, and, 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 and her Spanish is not even that great. But my point here is that the, that for this person and these folks to be talking about this prophecy and saying, it's already been fulfilled here. It's happening now. By the way, it means this. Like, for example, you will be, the, the wrongs of the past will be healed and you will get your lands that were stolen from you back. Mm -hmm. Um, or to say, we are writing this prophecy as it's happening, as things are happening right now. So let's do it. Let's do a good job to fulfill this prophecy is like a mockery. You're making a mockery of what is a real issue that people have the right to worship as they please. But don't use that as an opportunity to do some fake shaman BS and, and insert a fake prophecy into something just so that you could put it on a poster yeah. or, or, or make a run-walk event out of mm -hmm. it for money. That's gross. Um, I want to go to the tags in this post that I showed you earlier. Uh, was tagged with LaDonna and 30 others because you can see a lot of the Standing Rock people oh, yeah. jump right at you. Mm -hmm. um, we've got uh, Dean Dedman, Evan Duke, Lilla Sinclair, Jesse Sandoval, Wiaka. And then there's the, the tribal chief of the Come Crudo tribe, Juan B. Mancias. He was connected to the Nexus Lady and uh, Myron Dewey through the film Awake that was aired mm -hmm. at the Menominee Institute. You have Cam McCoy who's traveling with all of those folks too. Um, Jamie Sepa... I can't do it. What's her name? Uh, Skepakowski. Okay. Um, who else is in here? We've got Dave Critter who's traveling with that Michigan Ikwe lady. Mm -hmm. We've got Tatanka Banks, oh, right? Yeah. And that's it, right? Yep. Maybe you recognize some of these others on here, but I wanted to show you how many of them are connected directly to Standing Rock. <clears throat> Next, I want you to listen. Uh, there's a link for this... Um, video that uh, Nemo can drop in the in the comments so that you can go watch it for yourself. Um, I'd like a, the whole thing. I'd like for you to listen to the whole thing if you but I don't want to play it for you myself so that you can confirm what I have told you about what these folks are peddling and how little they know about it. In this video, Jake Lee, one of the folks that I told you was associated with Sandoval and all these folks in Tijuana that's been hanging out with the caravan um, and advising them and advising them are also advising Americans about doing sponsorships and how you become a sponsor. And at the very beginning of this video, they talk about the fact that they were going to get in touch with a lawyer so they could get better information so that they could give to the public about how you can become a sponsor, but they didn't really get around to that. So <clears throat> they're going to give, some information they think is partially correct about how you become a sponsor and what the process is for migrants going into the detention center system and to the asylum seeking process. So that tells you how unreliable this information is and how um, dangerous it is that these folks are essentially running around giving out legal advice without a legal license. And in this video, I'm going to skip the part where he talks about the fact that he's not really sure about the information he's about to give because he never got a hold of a lawyer that he needed to talk to before he gave the information out. But he thinks that some of the ways in which you can become a sponsor are this and this and this and this. And he's going to give you some background on it. And one of the things that he says is that there's this process by which you can become a sponsor. And normally the way that that goes is you have to go through an agency and they're usually contracted 
uh, under the federal government in some way that has screening processes to find a perfect match to a family. And also they probably check to make sure that your house is a safe place. What he doesn't, Jake Lee doesn't tell you is about other things that go along with being a sponsor that um, are requirements of those who become sponsors that are probably a high bar for most Americans, including the fact that if you, you're going to be a sponsor, you basically have to be independently wealthy. You have to own your own home and be able to show that you can support the person that's living there such that that person wouldn't have to work if they weren't allowed to or couldn't find a job for whatever reason. Okay. In addition to that, you probably have to be able to speak the language because there are requirements for those who are let out of the detention center, many of whom, as I've shown you, have to wear an ankle bracelet to be contacted on a fairly regular basis for check-ins, which if they do not answer for and don't meet the requirements of, they can go back into the detention center and or even be deported for. Okay. Third, you as the sponsor of any person that um, gets let out of detention have to also be the guarantee that they will go back. So when ICE looks for that person, they're going to go, hey, Duke, you signed off on here that you're going to be the sponsor and that you're responsible for mm -hmm. making sure that this person is living here. In fact, if this person changes address or uh, anything like that happens, you legally have to notify us immediately where this person is at because you're <clears> responsible <throat> for them. We turned them over to you out on bail. Yeah. Out on bail in most cases, which you have yourself paid for mm -hmm. this person in a guarantee that they will return upon their hearing date. Yep. Now, how are you a sponsor that is net? That's why I told you in the majority of these cases, these folks are literally connected in some way to the family. Mm -hmm. They're a relative of some sort or they're a longtime family friend, etc. Why would that be important to foment? Well, because these people are vulnerable. And two, because there's a lot of legal, res legally sp binding responsibilities that every sponsor has. So John Q. Public would not qualify to be a sponsor in many cases because A, they don't have Spanish. B, they're not homeowners and or can independently, wealthily support a family or a person or an individual. And three, cannot meet the requirements of the promise of taking that person in that they're going to make sure that that person has access to a phone and that they're going to speak on behalf of that person at any time that that person moves anywhere and notify ICE. So if you fail at those things, can you be held legally accountable if something were to happen? Yes. So what? How, how can you guarantee that a person that you're sponsoring doesn't decide to leave? Leave one day and not come back. Exactly. How are you going to respond for them if ICE calls and says, we need to speak to this person? And you say, well, they're not here right now. And they go, well, where are they? And you go, I don't know. I don't know. Can you be criminally charged for that wouldn't you like to know people that are thinking about sponsoring someone yeah these people aren't going to be able to answer those questions for you because they don't know the answers they don't know the answers nor they nor are they going to inform you of the of the burden the legal burden that you're going to take on not to mention the financial burden that one would have to take on if you sponsor someone and to make it seem like hey this is just a Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. So I want you to listen to this Jake Lee video so you can hear for yourself the proof that these folks don't have the resources or information that they are now readily providing to people out in the public. I did not get a hold of them, and so I don't have all the information I was hoping to have to make this video, but I can kind of go over the basics so you understand a little bit of the process and what it means to be a sponsor and what is um, what is required of you. So the way I'm going to explain it is as if you're going to go 
through myself or somebody down here who has specific people that need sponsors. Uh, there are organizations that you can apply to be a sponsor with. They will like do an interview, a home visit, and then match you up with an asylum seeker. That process is a little bit long. It's still good, so if you can't get a hold of me and you want to do it, please do that. Um, but if there's somebody that I'm looking for sponsors for and you're interested in being their sponsor, uh, just reach out to me. And this is how um, the whole process kind of goes. So to explain what happens when someone is seeking asylum here in Tijuana, like going over to the United States, they get a number um, to sign up to get on the list, basically. So they have a number here in Mexico, uh, which I think is through, like, Mexico Immigration or something like that. And once that number is called, then they go to the U.S. Immigration, and they have an initial interview. In this initial interview, it's very important for them to be prepared for it and know exactly what they want, like, what they're going to say, because um, they have to be very clear on the dangers of them, like, the dangers of them going back home, like, why they're seeking asylum, um, because through this interview, once they are done with it, they decide whether or not they are eligible for, for asylum. Uh, the reason why it's important to get sponsors is because they can be in detainment for up to six months to a year until their court case comes. So the point of a sponsor is to is for us to get them out of detainment and then for them to be able to go and live with someone and have their basic needs met there. So in order to be a sponsor, like you would have to have like to be the main sponsor, you would have to have space for them in your house, have enough uh, income where you can support another person. So food and uh, clothing and health care, if, if that's necessary. Like the health care part, though, we can find secondary sponsors, or I'm not sure if that's the official word for it. But basically, if there's a health care provider that can give pro bono work for this person, they can also write a, a uh, letter when, when they're going up for as an asylum seeker. They will need letters from all of us saying that, that we're going to sponsor them in this way. So they would do a letter saying, like, I, like in the time that they're waiting for their court hearing, I got, we will give them pro bono health care or dental work and things like that. So there, when somebody is going for asylum, the chances of them getting out of, getting out of um, detainment are kind of different for each person. So... I'm just going to read something that kind of explains that. Like, parents who are not separated from their children are the most likely to be released to volunteer sponsors. Uh, historically, transgender adults have received parole when bed space at the transgender detention center is limited. Um, and we don't really know specifically, like, how they're treating them in there. Um, what else? What does it say? So, with that one, I'm not exactly sure what the chances of them getting on parole is. For individual adult men and women, they're the least likely to receive parole and most likely to be detained for the duration of the court proceedings. Sometimes ICE will grant them exorbitant bonds in response to a parole release, and that could be up to about $20,000. So that's another thing that I'm working on is also getting bond money to get them out of detainment when they are able to. So they just made some pretty stunning admissions in this video. Yeah. And like I said, I'll be sharing the link to this video in the comments of this show so that you can go ahead and check out for yourself the whole video. And then I'm not taking out of context the fact that this person who's giving, essentially giving out advice to people, um, American people who would like to sponsor somebody from the migrant caravan sponsor somebody coming out of detention on the how to do it thing right yeah and it's the way the way he's putting it together too is it's like he's making it sound too easy to me and he's reading from these sheets of paper it's like well 
You just gave a, an analysis that was a lot deeper than what he just did in that five minutes of video that you played and had a lot more complexities. I mean, it's a very complex thing to, to and also you may not qualify to be a sponsor. You know, they might decide you don't have enough resources for you to be responsible for this person. They're just going to keep them in detention. You know, so they're, they're spreading this stuff like it's going to be easy. We'll need a sponsor for the medical. And it's all this sort of stuff like they're setting up, setting up this like uh, this wish list for this person. And all you need to do is say, yeah, I want to be a sponsor. So I think it's very misleading what, what he's actually saying. And he's very, very simplified too. And as he's reading it, you realize he doesn't even understand what he just read. Yeah. So two things that are very important about what he said. One, he said that three things that are very important about what he said. Yeah. He admitted that this um, going into the detention process could be from anywhere from six months to longer, uh, upwards of six months in detention, sitting in a prison, essentially. And so um, they need to try to get them out. He also then goes on to say, so I told you, they can't guarantee these folks that they're not going to just end up in a jail for six months mm -hmm. or longer, all the way through to the time that they request a hearing. In fact, the majority of people that come into this country, come here, that come here with the desire to request asylum, a large percentage of them leave without requesting asylum. And I'll tell you why. Because the conditions are so terrible within these detention centers. And they are told over and over again the chances of them being released while they await their hearing are slim, are difficult, and in the event that they would occur would be incredibly expensive. As you heard this person say, upwards of $20,000 in some cases. Yeah. So they give up. They say, and the government of the United States offers it to them. Would you like to self-deport, in which case you will be given another chance to come back into the country at some point in the future, or would you like to stay here, we'll not let you out of the detention center until you're hearing, so that you can request asylum and go to your asylum hearing and wait for as long as it takes to do that, and then also possibly be denied that asylum and deported back to your country anyhow. Which one do you want? Hmm. The only scenario in which people are usually okay with having to await a year or longer to hear their case is when they're free. Free not only to be outside of a detention facility, but free to work during that period of time. Not as an undocumented person un, un, uh, you know, in the shadows earning a pittance to the American worker, but as a visa employee able to earn a minimum wage equal to those American workers already here competing with American workers. Now, that's not a bad deal, right? Right. The only way that works, though, if out of the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that claim to want to come into this country and ask asylum, almost all of them are released through this bail system that this person is talking about. Hmm. The truth is, that's not how things work. And the reason is because we have a prison industrial complex that feeds off of quotas. Yes, and in fact, many of these are privatized prisons. And they have written into their contracts that you will get this low, low rate per person that is in this detention facility per day cost, but only if the detention facility is 75% or more full. And if the city or the state or whatever cannot keep that quota, you just get charged more. So remember when they were privatizing all these prisons all around the country? Mm -hmm. Lawmakers, especially conservative ones, who knew that this privatization of prisons was a very unpopular legislation, kept telling everyone in the public, don't worry, don't worry, we're only going to do it if it saves us money. If it doesn't save us money, we're not going to do it. Well, they structured their contracts so the only way you get to save money, and yes, in every instance, you will save money, but you got to keep that building full. Hmm. So whether or not they did it on purpose, wittingly or unwittingly, all of these caravan 
supporters that are creating these violent clashes at the border that are causing people to turn themselves over to uh, border patrol as soon as they cross the border and go into these detention facilities are feeding the ind prison industrial complex. They're filling all of these detention centers at a time when for the most part there was a zero net migration coming over the US Mexican border from Mexican immigrants. So they artificially created an exodus of migrants coming to the United States from Central America that on their own would never have been able to afford to come even through Mexico and especially not find a way of crossing into the United States. And as I said, many of them will not be granted bail. The majority of them probably will not be granted bail. What did they tell you the majority of this migrant caravan is made up of? Men. Mm -hmm. What have we found is true? Yeah. It's mostly men. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are women. Yes, there are children. But the vast majority of them are men. What did that person just tell you? Who are the people most likely to be granted parole or to be granted a bail? It's transgender people. Notice that this person, who I believe might be transgender themselves, was talking about the policy where they have a shelter, only one shelter that gets overcrowded pretty easily for transgender people. And so people that are transgender tend to get bailed out more frequently. Hmm. They're also more vulnerable. So they have a higher likelihood of getting bail which means that they can go out on their, uh, you know, with a, a ankle monitor and they get a humanitarian visa to work while they await their asylum hearing. They're also more likely to be granted asylum because they have a very, you know, easily verifiable reason that they're persecuted for. Yeah. Women that have not been separated from their children are also candidates, high candidates. Parents with a child are candidates for bail and more likely candidates for asylum, usually. And that's what he was reading uh, off of those sheets of paper that he didn't fully understand. Mm -hmm. You know what else? That's why a lot of these folks are traveling with children. That's why they're putting them over the border fence. That's why they're featuring them in these violent clashes that they themselves are orchestrating so that they can hold up that child and say, this person is more willing, more likely to get asylum than anybody else in this group. They know which ones are more likely to get asylum. So those are the cases that they want to get into the United States. And when they did do manage to get those families out on the streets like El Mohammed El Nakib did, they're going to make sure it makes news so you can see them win. Yeah. That doesn't mean those family members are going to stay in this country. It doesn't mean that they're actually going to achieve asylum in next year or the year after that when they finally get their hearing. It means that they got into a detention center and managed to get out mm -hmm. fairly quickly without being held, abused, tortured, starved, sickened by the, the conditions that are in these facilities mm -hmm. or made to languish there for years. Those are what these folks consider a win because it's the only ones that they're going to really be able to claim. You're not going to be able to see a bunch of these folks actually become U.S. citizens or get permanent U.S. residency or be able to stay here on a more permanent basis through asylum. And if you do, it will be few and far between. The numbers will be really, really small. So the other thing that I, wanted, I want you to notice about this uh, person's video is that they, they acknowledge that bail has a price. Yeah. How many thousands of people First of all, you know that they're not going to all get bailed out, right? So there's going to be a number of them that they concede that they know, especially young men, as, as this person told you, that are more likely to have an exorbitantly high bail mm -hmm. placed upon their release. You know why they do that? So that you can't raise the money. Because yeah. they know that poor pi migrants traveling alone usually don't have anyone that will put up $20,000 bail for one individual. Mm -hmm who may or may not go to their hearing, mm -hmm. who they don't know well enough to ensure that they will actually go to their hearing. So the fact that they're saying, the fact that they're claiming to these folks that they're going to be able to go into the United States, go into these detention centers, and come out with bail, Unless you've got a million dollars, millions and millions of dollars sitting around waiting to pay all of those bails that may or may not be granted, 
I don't know how they can make those kinds of guarantees to mm-hmm. people. Yeah. Here is uh, more of this um, Mayin Gan uh, posts. She's say, talking about their need for s- safe and discreet places here. If you'd read that for me. Sure, sure thing. I can't say her name either. Mayin Gan Ikwe is with Jennifer Trotter and 19 others. It's a beautiful, beautiful, uh, we are a beautiful family in Tijuana. We have some protectors doing some amazing protection work with the refugees that could use a helping hand with a safe, discreet place. I vouch entirely for these lovely beings. If tagged, you and if tagged, you and you are not in Tijuana or Mexico is because I'm hoping you'll share with connections you might know of. Please share through your networks and message me. Thank you for your support. So So she's um she says they have some protectors that are doing some amazing protection. And they're working with the refugees. Yep. They need a safe and discreet place. What does that mean? I mean they need to hide some people. Why do they need a safe and discreet uh, discreet place? They've already made it very clear that they have a bunch of activists down at the border, right? Yep. That are living that are they're raising money for the safe house for them. For their activist house or whatever mm-hmm. for like 25 activists or something like that's that. that's right that's right ongoing why can't they go to that place what's wrong with that place yeah. well, why she, do they need a safe and discreet place what's she, going on there she is not telling you making you guess you know and then she says i vouch entirely for these lovely beings yeah how can you vouch entirely for people that as you have seen have left uh, pa- a path of destruction and pain mm-hmm. everywhere they have been in the past. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. She does. Yeah. So people keep donating vehicles and homes to these folks, and they are always disappointed at how they leave these people's homes and yeah. vehicles. Mm-hmm. Um, she's also promoting the LGBTQIA caravan ah. in Spanish and in English. And so are other people. Remember who these folks are. They also know what uh, Jake Lee was saying. And believe me, they're all working together. Okay. And look at that. That's the Rob Wilson Hikate Society. It is. Promoting this. They're saying they need these things for these, the the safe house, the safe house. Pay attention to what I'm telling you. They need to make sure that they can take care of the people that are at the safe house. Who are these people? What are they connected to? Mm-hmm. Well, this may give you a little bit more information about what specific LGBTQIA group is there. Let me show you this post by Indigenous Life Movement. That's the same platform that Doug McLean is always live streaming from. But this is the guy that actually started Indigenous Life Movement. His name is William Hawk. This is his post and video, which he has now since taken down, hmm. requesting money for the LGBTQIA caravan okay. and their house. <clears throat> See that? Yep. Their safe house. He calls it a camp in the video. Okay. But it's really a safe house. And he gives you an excuse in the video. He gives a reason why, even though he's the founder of this platform called Indigenous Life Movement, he have, he never actually posts from it anymore, and he's basically handed it over to a white guy from New Jersey named Doug McLean. Hmm. And he says, he's really a private person. He likes to be in the background. Sure, that makes sense. That's why you start a media platform, so you can be a shy, <laughs> quiet person and stay in the background, right? That's right. That's right. But... Uh, he removed his, his video. I don't know why he removed it, but I wanted to share with you. Um, sadly, I didn't capture it before. So if you did, share it with me. Oh, definitely. Um, but he, he did say that he's trying to raise money for the LGBTQ refugee asylum caravan and that they have 80 people that are under the protection and they need more money for them. So um, there's another... My Iangan Ikwe post, <laughs> whatever her name is, <clears throat> t- 
tell us your real white girl name, please. That's right. Is it Becky? Yeah, it's probably Mary. It's probably like Becky or Trisha or something. Christmas in Tor- Tornillo? Mm-hmm. She's posting about Christmas in Tornillo, Texas. I told you we'd be ah. talking about this detention center. Oh. And this is really funny. Um, they don't know how to use the Spanish language very well. Yeah. I saw this uh, this line, Chinga la Migra, circulating mm-hmm. last year. Okay. I saw people start to use it in association with um, Occupy ICE and, and things like that. Alex Cohen is another guy that you may recall. He's the guy that wears vests without shirts and short shorts. Okay. Yeah. That, was out, that was out at... Um, Mississippi stand with oh, Kevin Gilbert. Yeah, yeah. And then was in Puerto Rico with Jonathan Fritzler on the boat mm-hmm, with mm-hmm. the guy with the flowy hair. Yeah. Alex Cohen. Oh, yeah. Now he's with Lisa Fithian and some other um, activists, all of whom were associated with Standing Rock, by the way, that are currently working outside of the detention center. Can you read what he posts about? Yes, spending the past few hours at a hotel shelter assisting with transportation of migrants that the government just dumped on the streets of El Paso. I honestly don't have many words. The stories of violence in people's homelands that they are fleeing, only to be met with pure cruelty in America. The stories from inside the detention camps are horrific. Moms with babies being denied water. So much of that one woman's breast milk was drying in detention. The guard wouldn't let the woman with a two-year-old baby sit down, then hit her in the face with a pencil and said, you're the reason I am not home on Christmas. It's freezing cold there. The government just dumped families on the street with some ankle bracelets, some without. No explanation about if there are court dates that they need to be at, legal obligations, or what the ankle bracelets are for. The local community that is organizing here didn't step up. There would be many more if it if the local community organizing here didn't step up, there'd be many more details. I have so many more thoughts, but I can, can't process it right now. So many flashbacks to Puerto Rico after Maria. The U.S. is orchestrating a deadly humanitarian crisis across its southern border. He's traumatized. So he makes mention of the fact that he was disaster vulturing yep, in Puerto, in Puerto Rico. Rico. Yep. He's done with Puerto Rico. Screw the Puerto Rican people. Yeah. Are they better now? No. Does he care? Mm -hmm. It's not about completing a job. It's about pretending to care about it and taking you along for the ride and your money. Meanwhile, he got to visit Puerto Rico, which was pretty fun. And then he got to go to Mexico, which is also going to be super great. He's going to be probably going down there along with the rest of these phonies very soon. But he's going to be traveling uh, along with all of these activists filming, capturing this, and setting the tone for how you feel about it. Hmm. Um, and, of course, this is being shared by this woman that was in Puerto Rico with him, right? Uh, okay. And that's not the only person that he's connected to from Puerto Rico and from Standing Rock before that and from all these other pipeline fights. The guy she's with in the car, Neville, was also, goes way back. There's Neville right there. And guess who else is there? Why, it's Jake Lee, the one that was just giving you the instructions on how to become a sponsor. Okay. And if you can see, it's, this is from 2017. Wow. These folks have been traveling around, working on For things, while. working on campaigns. Uh, if you go to um, my Ingan Ikwe's page and or Jake Lee's page or Neville's page, their, page, their photo uh, albums are replete with public publicly available photos of all of their adventures going back for years, Hmm. going back for years. So these folks have been working on these things together for a long time. And um, you've got Mainga and Neville in Puerto Rico here. If you, if you recall, they were part of that boondock. Oh, okay. Yes. I remember them. Yep. In the, in the cert boondock canine Mm -hmm. search and rescue unit. Mm -hmm. And there's Neville in the hat next to her. The uh, same guy that's in the car with her that goes, it's not a fight against the pipeline oh, that's right. on the southern border. <laughs> it's the, the wall. And she's that's like, right. oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, she's been traveling so many, for a long time with these same folks. Yeah. 
And here is um, part of the post that was put up by Alex Cohen about their blockade that they did, their water blockade that they did during Christmas in Tornillo. They had this like art installation yeah. where they took uh, gallons of water that they claim had been slashed by Border Patrol, which they kept and collected and painted green oh. to make a Christmas tree out of, oh, and really? which they claim that they collected from... <clears throat> Uh, no More Deaths, which is an organization that puts water out and supplies okay, yeah. and for humanitarian aid out in the in the desert. And as you can see, there's a bunch of the uh, gallons there. That tree that's in the distance all the oh, way in the okay. back is made up of those slashed gallon painted green things, and they hmm. put lights in them. They like to do these wow. art installations and, and um, you know, can you go see the press release on that? Yeah. What does it say? It says December 31st, so just a few days ago. <clears throat> Activists with Christmas in Tor Tor Neo, the occupation set up a water blockade during the shift change in front of the 20 charter buses carrying workers to the Torneo concentration camp. Media contact, uh, contact is Alex Cohn. Um, the blockade was deployed around 6 p.m. and buses were approaching the camp entrance for a shift change. It included banners, different vessels of water, and a Christmas tree created with water jugs slashed by United States officials recovered from the desert by no mas muertes. Shift change was disrupted for an hour by the blockade. Then the police started to turn the buses around and clear signs and water from the road. Two activists have been <clears throat> at Christmas in Torneo have since the start refused to leave the street, kneeled down, and surrounded themselves with water vessels from the blockade. After multiple warnings and threats of arrest, the two activists held their ground. Department of Homeland Security and El Paso County Sheriff said they would leave the scene without arrest and without the two leaving or dismantling the vigil. <clears throat> Once law enforcement cleared, the two committed holding the vigil up in the road till about midnight. About 30 minutes later, after Texas State troopers rolled up to the scene for the first time, threatened arrest and asking for identification. The two holding vigil were charged with pedestrian on roadway by Texas State troopers and the vigil was cleared. The water blockade inspires connections to movements across Turtle Island, which the heart of them all is a struggle to access to and protection of clean drinking water. And it was, oh, it's a fight for many Wachoni oh, and God. migrants. Yeah. yeah That's see how they, they connected they it. They worked Ooh. in the many Wachoni. Hey, they're going to throw Flint in. Yeah. You know what? Michi Egan, whatever her name is. Mm-hmm. She and Alex Cohen and her other buddy Neville were all at the Flint Flop House That's where right. they didn't pay rent. Oh yeah, where they squatted and then they just took off. Mm -hmm. They were all there too, taking advantage of the Flint water crisis. So That's right. It's only fitting that they should be taking advantage uh, of this. Uh, working Flint. And as in it, we see the struggles of Flint, indigenous struggle struggles against the oil and gas industry. Water privatization, the walks to bring water to... You see to, what you want to see because you create those connections. That's right. The walks to bring water to migrants crossing the border in the desert. Palestinians being denied water in occupied territories. Uh, the criminalization of humanitarian aid. Oh, yeah. You, holding, you have to make sure to throw the Palestinians in there. Otherwise, Linda Sarsour is not going to be That's right. And holding that those who have passed away in detention due to dehydration. The occupation lives on indefinitely. If you can feel called to join, you should. To live streams of the action, first streams of the blockade, blah, 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 blah. They say chinga la migra when... I think that because the word chinga could be... can be used as a replacement for the F word, but not yeah. usually like that. Not usually like that. Um... And the way that they used it, it actually means more like a, a more vulgar way of saying to have sex with something. I see. So what they're actually alluding to, the way that it's written, <coughs> is like, you know, having intercourse with ice. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That's how it... And I, when I read it, I thought... Hmm, somebody didn't, didn't do much homework on translating this, and it sounds like they want to have dirty sex with ice. Uh, <laughs> it does. Mm -hmm. Chinga la migra. Uh, tú te la chingas, yo no. A mí, yo no le entro. 
<laughs> Chingatela tú. Anyway, um, I found that funny because they just they just steal, appropriate, and along the way they make funny mistakes that make them look super stupid. Yeah. And I wanted to show you this article that appeared about the activists at the border. This is very concerning to me because, you know, they're putting their, themselves out there in the media to let people know that they're um, helping the migrants cross into the United States. Well, I mean, I don't know how you get any closer to trafficking people yeah. than this. They're even putting it in articles <clears throat> I know. that have been in the New York Times. They've been, they've, it's, it's been all over the place, this same content, okay? And they're saying that their um, activists opposed to Donald Trump's immigration policies, although I don't see how what they're doing right now isn't going to fuel the fire for the wall. I, they're literally creating mm -hmm. a crisis at the border where people are literally throwing their children over the border wall and attacking border patrol officials, which is going to make Trump's base scream for a wall. Yeah. These things are not happening organically. And they're saying in this article uh, that they're not causing them. They're just there to observe. We're just activists. We're just photographers. Some journalists are here. That's it. That's all. We're not the organizers. And we certainly didn't people put people up to this. Mm -hmm. We certainly didn't transport them here so they could do this in the first place with all of our camera equipment and yeah. all of our other, you know. And the truth is, Yes, they did. Yes, they did. You and your daddy, because you got the receipts, and you know that you guys are the ones orchestrating these violent clashes. Mm -hmm. That's why I call today's show Caravan Clashes, ah. because that's what they're about. They are trying to create violent clashes with authorities in Mexico on the border, and they want blood. They want blood because if it bleeds, it leads, and it's what's going to pull at your heartstrings more. And you know what? If you can throw some dead kids on there on top of it, that's what they put on top of that Christmas tree of slashed gallons out there. They put the pictures of those two dead babies on there. Really? Yeah. They put them on the as the angels on the top of the tree. Wow. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna cash in on those dead babies. Of course they are. Send your money to them. Hmm. They're going to pray for the dead babies. They're going to put them on top of the Christmas tree. And they are, um, the people quoted in this article, you may recognize Duke. Uh, if you scroll down, they said after a leading, a learning, after learning of a possible conflict, <laughs> doesn't it sound like uh, the way that um, Rob Wilson said, I am learning from reports that people lock themselves down inside oh, yeah, of the yeah, warehouse. Yeah. Really? You didn't help them do that? You didn't plan it with them? You didn't give them the reconnaissance information to do it before the cops got inside? I think that's exactly what happened. Hmm. So after learning of a possible conflict, 11 U.S. volunteers who were in Tijuana headed to the border to provide medical assistance. Oh, just like Melanie Stoneman. Yep. Just like standing Just right. like Vanessa Bolin. Yeah. Just yeah. like all of those medics, those fake medics. Mm -hmm. Was Lolly B there? She's a fake medic. Yeah. Uh, they have all of these so-called medics that aren't medics, like Christina Hollenbeck, who was on Russian television news the day after November 20th, telling people, I'm a medic, and we were hauling people off of this area that were that had, had hypothermia, blah, blah, blah. They're not medics. They're agitators, they're organizers, they're orchestrators. They're the ones that created the violent clash that you are watching. Mm -hmm. Lily Sinclair and all of these people from their uh, Asylum Seekers Caravan Support Network, which now they're just shortening down to Border Support Network. Okay? Oh, okay. They got to change their name every five minutes. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you'll be able to track them. So... She says that they had about 11 volunteers that w that went to the border to provide medical assistance and to document the events. Of course they're going to be there. Rob was probably front and center, making sure to get the best pictures for his photography page. Yeah. To sell to Yes Magazine and other magazines that pay him for events that he and other organizers along with him helped to orchestrate. Must be nice work if you can get it, huh? Oh, yeah. The activists... And this this is a quote from Lilith Sinclair, a spokeswoman for the group. That's the spokeswoman they chose? 
The person that was lying about people going into the ocean, putting out false information about a dead girl, yeah. and the people that and, and the people that went into the ocean and never came out, that weren't real. Mm-hmm. That's the spokesperson that they chose. The activists, part of a group known as the Border Support Network, have said they were ban- banding together to counter what they view as U.S. government's violations of asylum seekers' rights. They've also challenged the U.S. government position that agents deployed tear gas after coming under attack. So they're there to say, uh, whatever the police say is untrue, we were there to witness it, and the aggressors were the Border Patrol, yep. not the asylum seekers. Um, they have also challenged the U.S. government position that agents deployed tear gas. It says, this attack on migrants peacefully seeking asylum was crippling, inhumane, <coughs> and unprovoked, Sinclair said in a statement on Wednesday. The clash in Tijuana was the second incident in less than two months in which dozens of migrants tried to cross the border and were met with gas. The activists were not present for the entire confrontation. I don't believe but did not witness any provocations by migrants in the time that they were there. So when they were there, the migrants were just little angels the entire time. Although they can't claim they don't know what happened in the very beginning. Sinclair, a 24-year-old woman from Portland, Oregon, said in an interview, when Sinclair arrived, she saw a small group near the border fence trying to tell agents that they planned to seek asylum. She then saw agents deploy tear gas. The U.S. Customs and Border Patrol Agency said it could not immediately respond to a request for comment, citing a backlog due to the U.S. government shutdown. CBP previously said agents launched smoke, pepper spray, and tear gas, known as CS gas, only after migrants threw rocks. Quote, this is among the lowest level of response we can give, said Joshua Wilson, vice president of the San Diego Border Patrol Union. A rock is deadly force. A Reuters witness said, a Reuters witness did not see migrants throw rocks. The Associated Press reported rocks were flung after tear gas was deployed. The CBP said on Wednesday that an internal investigation of the use of CS gas on December 31st was still underway. And on Thursday, the Mexican government requested a full investigation. Anti-fascists. Hmm formed in November in response to the migrant caravan that drew Trump's ire the activist coalition includes this activist coalition includes self-described anti-fascists and advocates for causes such as indigenous rights water access Sinclair said some members meet through protests some members met through protests over the Dakota access pipeline of course and a police shooting in Ferguson, Missouri. Mm-hmm. See, I told you they were there first, and yep. they went to Standing mm-hmm. Rock. Mario Osuna, Tijuana Secretary of Municipal Development and a spokesperson for the Foreign Ministry, said he had no information about the group. Mexico's Immigration Institute did not immediately respond to requests for comment. Under Mexican law, U.S. citizens may undertake voluntary work for up to 180 days without a visa. Um, in mid-November, the group ordered a safe house in Tijuana, housing about 25 volunteers at a time, most from the United States, said Evan Duke uh-huh. of Seattle, wow. one of the organizers. I told you he was one of the main organizers. Mm-hmm. The border, And you know he was working directly with Wesley Clark. So Wesley Clark yeah. is involved in all of this stuff too, still. Mm-hmm. I'm waiting for the vets. Where's the vets? Yep. The Border Support Network is funded largely by individual donations. Uh Uh-huh, like from uh, Billionaire Wealth? Yep. Like Nexus Group people? Sinclair said, The group mobilized quickly after receiving word of the clash, heading out with warm clothes, medical supplies, and water, said Duke. 45. He stayed behind to support volunteers from the safe house, adding that the activists had not transported migrants to the border or otherwise instigated the incident. Really? Right. I don't believe that part. I think you totally instigated it. Why? We didn't instigate anything or take them there. We just happened to be there at the same time That's with right. our camera equipment mm-hmm. and our journalists. Mm-hmm. 
just like you were every other time before in every other campaign you've worked on. Yeah. How miraculous is that? Um, Dennison said he was struck by three plastic pellets. CBP said it does not deploy rubber bullets, but does use pepper balls around rubber projectile containing pepper spray. Eric Hernandez, a 24-year-old Salvadoran who tried to enter the United States, said American volunteers helped bridge the language gap at the border. The American volunteers, who don't speak any Spanish, were there to help. Mm. They spoke with the American side, he said. We asked them for a little bit of respect for the children. And it says, reporting by Julia Love in Mexico City and Mohammed Salem in Tijuana. Okay. Additional reporting by Christina Cook in San Francisco and Lizbeth Diaz in Tijuana. Editing by Tom Brown. Wow. And it was an incredible piece of information to see Lilith Sinclair mm-hmm. and Duke, Evan Duke, all in there, out out in the open, telling people they have a place for volunteers in Mexico and that they're there. Well, I suppose at this point your cover is blown and everybody knows you're there yep. anyway, so what's the point of hiding it? Mm-hmm. Um, but know that these anti-fascists especially... Uh, the likes of Evan Duke have criminal records and mis, um, you know, misrepresent what they're what they're there to do, to a large degree. They're also promoting a, inside the Asylum Seekers Caravan Support Network the First Peoples Network. Check this out. This is from the Asylum Seekers Caravan Support Network, and there's they're posting about the First Peoples Inter Indigenous Network of the Americas. If you scroll down to the bottom of that post, you'll see they have a website there, the Tribal Border Alliance. And uh-huh. if you go to the Tribal Border Alliance page, um, I can share with you the tribalborderalliance.org um, summit date that they're uh, promoting in 2019. Yes. You want to read what it says there? This, this summit <clears throat> is going to cover Duke? Yeah, let's see. It's... Interesting stuff here. Um, it's the Yaki Tribe of Arizona, the National Congress of American Indians, and the Tohono O'odham oh. Nation invite you to attend a tribal border summit, January twenty fourth to twenty fifth, two thousand nineteen, at the Pascua Yaki Casino del Sol Resort Conference Center in Tucson, Arizona. Mm-hmm. The summit is intended to provide an opportunity for leaders of indigenous nations and tribes located on or near the international boundaries of Canada, Mexico, and Russia what? To, and Russia to discuss border crossing related issues and efforts to facilitate the mobility of indigenous people. How did Russia get in here? I don't know. I don't know anything about border issues with Russia with indigenous people. All while securing tribal lands in the United States. The summit will develop a broader tribe's proposal to facilitate indigenous border crossings into traditional territories. Facilitate indigenous border crossings into, into traditional, traditional ter- territories. Okay, we're talking about people crossing with not uh, country's borders, their own reservation borders. No, they're talking about co- crossing into other countries' borders. They're talking about nations that are on the borders of other countries. But again... As I've explained to you, reservations are within the United States borders. They're not on top of the border, That's which true. means no native nation controls any border mm-hmm. between the United States and Mexico or between the United States and Canada or between the United States and any other country. No um, native nation controls any part of the border or border crossings. So, good luck with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds, sounds nice. Yeah, it sounds and it like sounds it. sounds like they're trying to facilitate this for their own people. Yeah. Which is their right to do. They need mm-hmm. to be able to negotiate people crossing and having their um, ceremonies on both sides with their relatives, etc. I think this has more to do with the caravan and it's being posted in the caravan support network. That's true. Because as I told you, I have text messages between Myron Dewey and somebody else talking about the Tohono O'odham tribe mm-hmm. and that tribe, because of its proximity to the border, facilitating illegal crossings onto Indian territory and even 
uh, promises of sanctuary and jobs within that tribe. I don't know how they plan to do this or why Myron Dewey, who's working directly with Evan Duke, was considering this possibility from this tribe, this specific tribe. Yep. Or how they plan to do it or if it's even legally possible. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily matter because it's in the Asylum Caravan Support Network page and it's part of their plans anyway. Yeah. And as I have learned with these folks that were, um, you know, engineering all of this stuff and manipulating all these groups at Standing Rock and that went on to do it later on, their possibilities of success don't really matter so much as their ideas and dreams and their yeah. ability to raise money and support for those ideas and dreams. Because, you know, when they move on to the next thing without having finished the other thing or the thing before that or the thing before that, none of you seem to mind. And you give them more money and you give them more media attention and they just keep going and going and going. So um, let me look at this agenda for a minute. Look at what's on the agenda for this event. All right. If you look at what's on the agenda, they're going to talk about the purpose of the summit. They talk about who's co-hosting the summit. That's not really a line item. They talk about the border alliance. That's the discussion of the structure of the alliance. What nations are going to be there? The Pasquayaki, the Tohono O'odham, right? And what is the what is the topic of discussion they're going to be discussing? Southern border issues, yeah. not northern border issues, not other border issues. Southern border issues. Then they're going to talk about northern border issues with the uh, Kotenai tribe and the Alaskan border issues. Uh, invitation still pending. Somebody else, maybe. That's it. That's all they're doing. They're talking about border issues at this thing. That's what the Tribal Alliance is about. Mm -hmm. It's about crossing the border. Yeah. So next, you have a press release by Myron about what happened. What happened <clears throat> that those... 11 volunteer witnesses, Lillis Sinclair, Evan Duke, and others were there to witness at the border. What, what happened according to Digital Smoke Signals? Can you read that, Duke? Yes. We posted a Department of Homeland Security press release yesterday regarding this incident. Mm -hmm. the C and then they took it down. The CBP utilizes some of the most sophisticated technology available, yet there is no accountability to those of us who fund this billion-dollar agency. This is why we need indigenous eyes and ears filming and reporting such actions. We encourage everyone to research the narrative. Think carefully on all media sources you read, including what we post, and analyze who benefits from such a narrative. Mm -hmm. And he's got the tear, uh, U.S. fires tear gas across Mexico border to stop migrants. Right. And then we have the digital smoke signals rep press release on this. This is why it's so important for indigenous people. Indigenous people need to share their stories, media and video through indigenous eyes. The border has some of the best technology taxpayers money can buy. All the indigenous people in us Americans need to request high tech cameras, media posted all along the border walls as legal obligation to hold both sides accountable. We need media eyes along the border to hold Border Patrol accountable for their actions, comments, to said refugees, and the use of non-lethal weapons. And then there's a press release from the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, January 1st, 2019. Andrew Meehan, Sister Commission, Assistant Commission for Public Affairs. It's a CP, CBP issue statement on illegal border crossings in San Diego sector. The following is based on initial operation reporting. Last night, approximately 150 migrants attempted to illegally enter the United States by climbing over and crawling under border fence in San Diego sector due to CBP increased presence. A first group of 45 turned back towards Mexico. Shortly thereafter, migrants began throwing rocks over the fence at the CBP agents and officers. Several teenagers wrapped in heavy jackets, blankets, and rubber mats were put over a, the concertina wire. Border Patrol agents witnessed members of the group attempt to lift toddler-sized children up and over the concertina wire. And concertina. Having, 
concertina <laughs> while you're having difficulty accomplishing the task in a safe manner. Agents, agents were not in a position to safely assist the children due to the large number of rocks being thrown at them. To address the rock throwers assaulting agents and risking the safety of migrants attempting to cross, who were already on the U.S. side, both smoke and minimal countermeasures were deployed. Agents deployed smoke, pepper spray, and CS gas to a position upwind of the rock throwers and south of the border fence. The deployments were not directed at the migrants attempting entry on the U.S. side or at the fence line. The rock throwers were located on the south of the fence in an elevated position both above the border fence area and the incursion attempt. These countermeasures successfully support the rock throwers, causing them to flee the area. Most of the migrants attempting to the attempting the incursion to include those with children returned to Mexico via a hole underneath the fence and by climbing over the fence. No agents witnessed any of the migrants at the fence line, including children experiencing effects of the chemical agents, which were targeted at the rock throwers further away. 25 apprehensions, including two teenage migrants, were made. Under CP, CBP use of force policy, this incident will be reviewed by CBP's Office of Professional Responsibility. Okay. So then they... I want you to see the post that he took down, which included Lilith Sinclair's press release telling people what she feels in response to the CBP putting out their press release about what happened. Yeah. What they what they think, you know, and uh, really happened. I see. Kind of contradicting some of the things that CBP put out. Mm. So this is the post from her. Um, as you can see, it says... Media contact, Lilith Sinclair. Yeah. And if you go to um, the press release one, you'll see just the first page of that oh, okay. that she had posted. And this is on hashtag our resistance, which is originally the Occupy inauguration page. I see. They still have the URL at the top of the Facebook page. On our is hashtag our resistance, which has been changed to mm -hmm. that that reads Occupy Inauguration. Okay. So you can still tell, tell it was originally Occupy Inauguration, which was run by Evan Duke, which then was given over to Myron Dewey, mm -hmm. as which the as was the Asylum Seeker page, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. And Lilith Sinclair is being shared in that page as well as on digital smoke signals. Mm -hmm. Just so you know. These folks are all working together at the assist with the assistance <clears throat> or uh, at the request of yeah, with the orchestration okay. of yep. coordination of coordination of these folks. In her first page of her press release, this is what she had to say. Can you make that bigger? I can try. Can you make it more giant? That's not very big. It's very, very small. It's hard. It's so tiny. I know, but it's a very small picture. That Yeah. There we go. And if you go and read this, she basically uh, changes the way that, um, you know, what, what she claims happened. Yeah. She said that they tried to get onto the U.S. side and surrender for asylum, as is, a, as is allowed under international law, under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. She's like, she's, I'm a lawyer. Yeah. And at that point, there was only about three to four Border Patrol vehicles on the scene. Within half an hour of the immigrants continuing their slow walk along the border, approximately 20 vehicles had arrived on the U.S. side of the wall. Migrants sat quietly against the wall on the, in the hope CBP would not engage them and might disperse the smaller number. Um, my, male migrant. What does it say? While migrants sat on the wall, a number of CBP agents walked alongside the concertina wire. Agents then threw projectiles at the wall in an attempt to intimidate migrants. A small number of migrants ran away from the wall and up the dirt hill. And the small group of people dispersed CBP agents through a single tear gas canister over the wall. As it deployed, the rest of the migrants scattered and retreated up the hill. At that point in time, after tear gas had dissipated, approximately 50 migrants made their way to the wall. An estimated 35 CBP agents were very visible standing outside of their vehicles on the U.S. side. The agents began posturing with their weapons and pointing them toward the wall as they yelled for people to return. 
migrants and witnesses yelled over the wall to explain they were trying to present themselves for deter uh, detainment and to begin the legal process of applying for asylum. As agents shouted for people to return and migrants shouted to assert their rights and explain that children were present, CBP, unprovoked, deployed multiple canisters of tear gas over the wall. The tear gas reached about 80% of the migrants, <clears throat> witnesses, medics, and journalists assembled. A male migrant dislocated his knee as he ran and had to be carried up a, a hill for treatment. After the second dairy deployment of tear gas had dispersed, migrants made their way back to the hill next to the wall on the Mexico side. <clears throat> okay. So, um, what what do you make of this retelling of what happened? I mean, yeah. I, I'm willing to concede I don't necessarily oh. believe everything the Border Patrol yeah, says. And they I don't believe what, a lot of things and in plus, the United States. Plus the story, it was very little um, coverage. It was one story that was recirculated through Associated Press and all these news agencies. And what this was, was a complete counter. It's like, who threw the rocks? And you know, the whole thing is, I, I'm not going to just say, well, the border patrol is in the right and all this sort of stuff. But I, I have actually have seen them behave a little bit different than other law enforcement, you know, in these situations, like they're a lot more cautious, mm -hmm. especially with the clergy, when they were all trespassing and being told to go away. They're, they're like, hey, you know, if you want to go bless people, why don't you just go through the right way? Go right over there and go bless them. You can't be walk up to the fence here and do it. But I think that this 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 rework and dramatization of it mm -hmm. is like, well, who threw the rocks? It, it just people were were just slowly moving in. They were just going to you know hope that they weren't noticed too much, weren't bothered. And the next thing you know, bam, they're being fired upon with hell and fury, you know. And it's trying to explain that they they were totally victimized. They weren't doing anything wrong. And it's just a rework, and it also puts herself in an eyewitness position and all these other people that were just happened to be there at the same time had nothing to do with what these people were doing, but they're just, Hey, mm -hmm. something's happening. Something's happening over there. Let's go over there. And f Oh, we happen to have all our camera equipment here and everybody's documenting. And in fact, we're going to hold them accountable. If they do anything wrong, we'll be right here to hold them accountable. It's like they positioned themselves to be the tellers of the truth of what really went on. And I just think, I think most of it's just made up. You know, because think, of who we're dealing with. I think they're also uh, putting themselves in a position where you have to question whether, I mean, we have evidence of the fact that they're not just there to witness. Yeah. And that they're not just there as, uh, you know, innocently at the right time, at the right place with all of their camera equipment and with their media friends. Uh, no, there's orchestration and planning that's behind this. But in addition to that, uh, we know that they're organizing with other folks to actually orchestrate these violent clashes in the mm -hmm. first place, right? Right. So if they're there for that and they're actually helping people cross into the United States illegally, not as there to be witnesses, not as there just to be medics, not as there just to, to um, document what happened, but as perpetrators of the act, then I believe they could also be charged with crimes. Mm -hmm for helping people enter yeah. the country undocumented, mm -hmm. as well as for orchestrating any of the violent clashes yeah. that yeah. get people hurt on either side, exactly. whether it's Border Patrol agents or migrants, migrants themselves. Yeah. And here's what they said about the wall. This is what Sinclair posted about this wall incident. Could you read that? I sure could. This is Lilith Sinclair. Mm -hmm. I rang in the new year alongside migrant relatives in Mexico and my radical loving comrades Helping people who are going across the border. Hear that? Right there. Helping, helping people, people who are going, going across, across the, border. the border. Getting tear gas, doing medic support, and aggressively reminding Border Patrol that legalities and laws do, do not make reality moral or, nor just. I watched children be lowered over the wall as Border Patrol actively threatened their parents with tear gas and rubber bullets and told them to turn back. I watched them tear, watched them tear tear gas a crowd with a two-year-old visibly among them, held in a mother's arms, and when the other youth and their families had just been lowered across the wall. I am now safe, in a bed, trying to process the atrocities of the U.S. and escape into another world. I plan to get a write-up done of the actualities of everything that happened last night and this morning from someone on the front lines. 
I have pictures and video to share, too, from comrades beside me. In the meanwhile, Happy New Year, I suppose. I sincerely hope that you're all using your voice and your platforms to, at the very least, call attention to these issues and the abhorrent human rights violations by this government and other capitalistic oligarchical governments. 2019 is the year to join the revolution. There is not time for anything else. Your si- silence is compliance. Wow. We have to join a revolution now. Jesus. How much is it going to cost, Lilith? Yep, just one can small give, donation. Can you give us an idea of the cost? Um, here is the admins for Occupy Inauguration. I just want to remind you of some of the folks that are ma- running this page. If you could go all oh. the way to the beginning of the page, you can still see the Facebook group at the very top, the URL there. Yeah. It says Occupy Inauguration. Oh, uh, okay, yep. But it resolves to... to Hashtag our resistance. Our resistance. See. I see. And if you scroll down here, you can see who the admins are. You, you recognize some of those folks, dude? Yeah, I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so I can see it a little bit bigger. Here's um, what some of these people's... Oh, digital smoke signals. Dig- yep. Um, Angel Arkel Bloss. That's Arkel one Bloss. of the people with real progressives. <clears throat> digital smoke signals. You've got... Matt, Matt Rem- Remmel with, his, with in- Last Real Indians. Last Real Indians, yes. Mary Garcia. And connected to Chase Iron Eyes. Yeah. There's Myron Dewey. Uh, Regina Brave. There's Regina Brave. There's Yane Indigo. Yane oh, Indigo yeah. was one of the, uh, the, the organizers working directly with Maggie Day and Seven McDonald and the people from Russian Television News. She was hanging out with, uh, uh, what was her name? Ah. Ah. She's um. She's that Russian oh. television news reporter with the big eyes that was at the casino with uh, Wesley Clark and all those other folks at the end, and um, Ed Higgins. I can't remember her name right now. Yeah, anyway. me either. Um, David Keith Cobb. Cobb. Okay, that guy's showing up everywhere. Wasn't he the Green Party dude? Or? Mm-hmm. So. That's who some of the admins on this page are. Huh. And of course, did you see who else was on there? Susie Desba was there. Did you see her name? No. Oops, I'm trying to find it. Where'd it go? It's right there. You had you were touching it. Your your thing was on top of it. Right there. Occupy inauguration admins. So it see it says admins. Scroll down, please. Susie, Evan, and 17 other members. Oh, wow. Jesse, Lilith, and 11 other members are moderators. See that? Yep. There's a bunch of other people. Go check it out for yourselves. Now, I want to show you what's going on right now. What are these folks doing right now in in Tijuana? What's happened today? So, they were talking about the eventual closure of the warehouse at El Barretal because, as I told you, you can't keep housing people indefinitely and paying for their rent and their food every day while they refuse to even get jobs on humanitarian visas. Now that they've been given ample time to do that and they still refuse, they're giving them a time frame. We're going to be closing the shelter by such and so date, so you best better get a job pretty quick and start figuring out what you're going to do. Um, and I showed you the video of the Exodus guy going around questioning people at the mm-hmm. Barretal Asking them, like, what are you going to do? And they're like, well, we're going to be homeless. They're super excited about the new caravan that's coming. They think this is the cavalry coming to reinforce them under which the government will have to reopen new shelters. And all of these other people that have been staying at the shelter, these thousands that remain, will be able to just continue living there Mm -hmm. and not have to leave and get jobs. That's not how it's going to go, though. I guarantee you that's not how the Mexican government is going to let this go roll. So the uh, other warehouse one that inexplicably was open for them and they were allowed to have for another month, which has already lapsed, is now going to be set to be closed. And so officials went down there to condemn it today. You can see here, there's the notice from a video that um, I was watching about this. It says of this, as of this date, this place is condemned. It's a place that does not have public services anymore, blah, blah, blah. And they condemned it. 
Now, um, I want to bring you a video clip from Frontera.info. Frontera.info is one of the news organizations I've been following in Tijuana to find out what's going on up to the minute. And they were down there. And I want you to see who is rummaging around in the warehouse as they're trying to shut it down. Before I get to this, though, I want to just tell you. They went down there today to put that notice on there to let them know that they are, are going to be closing. They were going to be closing it as of noon that day. So people had time to get on buses, to okay. move, to make arrangements, etc. They're warned. They then came back at noon to put up the sign and tell everyone it's time to get out. Mm -hmm. Right. At that point, there was chaos. They refused to leave. There were some of the leadership that were there, some of the organizers that were there saying they had a lawyer and they had a stay. They had some kind of a legal um, uh, estoppel or some kind of, a, you know, um, emergency protective, war uh, protective um, order from the court that allowed them to stay there longer. That the government couldn't take them out. Hmm. Although I did not see a single person produce any kind of legal document I or see. be able to provide proof of what they were saying, but that's what they were saying in the videos to the press. And so they ended up staying. They did not close it today. They've been told tomorrow at noon they're all going to have to be gone by then, and then they're going to be taking you know people out of their probably by force, forcing them to go over to the other shelter until it too closes in the middle of January. But mayhem ensued. First, I want to show you this clip of a, a video showing who is at the Barretal and just pay attention and I'll um, give you a rundown of what happens in the video that's all in Spanish here in a minute after it's done. <laughs> So I just wanted to give you a little taste of that. But did you notice who was in that video right at the very beginning? Oh, wasn't that the Frenchman? Yes, that was uh, Simbad, Amadeo, <laughs> uh, Rumney, Guggenheim. Guggenheim, yes. There he was, right front and center. Mm -hmm. But you know who else was there? These American organizers, these... Um, uh, manipulators, exploiters of the caravan, they are there. They were there. So this reporter goes back in after they're being told at the time that now they're going to have to leave. Remember I told you first they went there to tell them they were going to be uh, closing it down at, by noon. And then they returned at that time to do that. And at that time, the media went into the shelter and they were walking around watching people pick up their tents, asking them, are you going to be one of the people that leaves? Are you going to be one of the people that stays? What are your plans? What have you? And this reporter, I'm not going to show you the whole video, but this reporter walks up to a group. There's a guy that's on a megaphone and he's telling people, you know, um, it's not up to anybody but God what happens to us and what's going to happen to us. Just have faith. He's telling people that. And the reporter walks up and asks him, how do you feel about the shelter being closed? And he says, I don't think it's right. I don't think it's fair. 
they were questioning other people around there that said they weren't going to, we're not going to leave. They refused to leave. They asked him why. And they said, cause we don't like to go. We don't want to go. We like it here. We like where we are. So they're just, they're, they don't even come up with good excuses anymore for mm-hmm. why they won't leave and go to the Barretal. They're just going to make people pay for two different shelters in Mexico because they feel like it. Um, and he then walks up to this group of people, including these American organizers that are sitting there planning, that are kind of in a circle. And when he walks up there, there's some people on the perimeter of this group kind of watching out for them so that if anybody comes close, they can alert the group that their, you know, their, their plans may be overheard by someone. So this reporter gets too close and you hear somebody shoo him away and be like, you know, you need to get out of here. And, you know, he uh, doesn't. So one of the American organizers tells him to eat a penis, but she uses a different word. Hmm. And she she immediately out of the bag with violent, vulgar language, angry. You know, she almost jumps out and is like, why don't you eat a blank? And then I don't think I don't know if he, this reporter understood what was said to him, but he immediately got pushed away by a Spanish speaking woman organizer that's there that says this is private and he's like how is that this is a public shelter this isn't private and he's like well this is a private conversation this is private property this is a private conversation it's like this is a mexican reporter reporting for the mexican people in his own country where the mexican government has paid for your shelter that you're telling him he can't film inside of or listen to you uh plan your plans in of so I found that really remarkable. I wanted you to see this clip and how this Mexican reporter is treated by these obviously American entitled organizers in the warehouse. Se encuentran en esta zona y las cuales han sido advertidas ya de un posible desalojo a las 12 al mediodía. ¿Y usted? ¿Usted sigue aceptando el desalojo? No. ¿Qué sigue de aquí para usted? A ver, lo que salga para adelante. ¿Tampoco quieres ir a otro albergue? No. ¿Por qué? Acá estoy bien. ¿Aquí? Sí. Ajá. Bien, voy a estar bien acá. Pero si ya no hay espacio para este, para aquí, para el albergue, ¿qué más vas a hacer? Sí, hay espacio. Y a la gente le gusta. ¿Qué? Aquellos que se acaban de unir a la transmisión, les informamos, nos encontramos en la conocida bodega, el albergue de la zona norte, a una media cuadra de la unidad deportiva Benito Juárez, en donde todavía queda un grupo importante de personas que están siendo advertidas sobre un desalojo al mediodía y estamos pues, llevándoles a ustedes algunos de los testimonios. la llegada de más militares. Sí, vienen una caravana de, de, de 15 mil personas, son los que tenemos anunciado por Facebook, pues yo digo una cosa y le, pues, le digo al gobierno de Estados Unidos que se ponga la mano en la conciencia, no somos delincuentes como lo toman, somos personas que queremos progresar y salir adelante, queremos un trabajo que es tenerlo fijo, estable, pues ese es el sueño de todo, de todo hispano, llegar a Estados Unidos y trabajar. ¿Pero qué opinas de que acabas de anunciar que van a mandar más militares que van a estar aquí todo el mes de septiembre, hasta el mes de septiembre durante todo el año? Gobierno? Pues en, en verdadamente pues no sé qué vamos a hacer. Creo de que lo creo que si ellos no lo quieren tener aquí pues podemos llegar a un acuerdo. Hay varios compañeros que han luchado mucho pues si, si quieren. La última palabra la tiene Dios, compa. La última palabra la tiene Dios. Tiene que tranquilizarse ustedes. Tienen que confiar. Este es uno de ellos, Maxi de Gorro. Pando. Joven, le robamos un minuto. 
qué, cuál es la, la resolución que han acordado ustedes como No, grupo? estamos esperando nada más que, que Dios dé la respuesta nada más. Porque de Dios depende. ¿no? ¿Tú, ¿Tú estás eh, de acuerdo en que se va a desalojar hoy o no? No, es que no estoy de acuerdo porque aquí estamos bajo techo y hay mujeres y niños acá. Pues. ¿verdad? Y estamos a la expectativa de que, que Dios ponga en el sentimiento del presidente de que no nos saque porque que no tengo por lo que no den chance nada más. ¿Verdad? Muchas gracias por tu tiempo. Bueno. ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué? Es privado, privado reunión. Pero pues es un albergue público. Es privado propiedad, ¿ok? No ¿Ustedes es público, quiénes son? Claro. ¿Usted quién es? Soy reportero de Frontera y okay. de Grupo Gil. Nosotros tenemos una reunión aquí, quisiéramos mantener la privacidad de este momento hasta que nos invitenos a participar, ¿ok? Pero ustedes son activistas, son... No puedo comentar. ¿Se nos van? Continuamos en esa transmisión en vivo para Frontera del Grupo Gil y bueno, un grupo de jóvenes aparentemente extranjeros que no quieren permitir que los grabemos, ellos están teniendo una reunión, dicen es privada y al parecer pues se están poniendo de acuerdo para alguna estrategia en este punto en el albergue de la zona norte, no sabemos cuáles son sus planes, no los quisieron compartir, nos quisimos acercar con ellos y ustedes ya vieron la reacción que tuvieron. You can also see they're covering their faces. Did you yeah. see the anarchist mm -hmm. A on the back of her yep, shirt? Yep, I saw that. And from her speech pattern, I can tell that she's a Mexican-American. She doesn't know how to speak Spanish like Mexicans do. Ah. Um, and also, she was just extremely entitled and rude. Yeah. Uh, but, and they were like grabbing at the equipment of these Mexican reporters. It's mm -hmm. like, why are you touching my equipment? Why are you touching my equipment? This is they, private. Because they feel entitled mm -hmm. to do whatever they're going to do with this group of migrants from the caravan. They're going to command them. They're the ones that are going to control them. And they're not going to let the Mexican government move them or process them through their legal system so that they can disperse the caravan and go on with business as usual. So these folks are there to create as many problems as possible. Let me show you the 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 um, uh, warehouse post that Sandoval Jesse Sandoval made about the removal of these folks, and in it you can see Rumney down there. He's in the pictures. You see him right there. Yeah, there he is. There's a French man. Mm -hmm. Um, what does she say, honey? Federal police still threatening use of force. <laughs> Situation near Benito Juarez, Tijuana, migrant caravan asylum seeker. For last-minute updates and live stream rep reports, please visit Pueblo Exodo Cron Crónicas of the Migrant Caravan. Migrant caravan. La Policía Federal en Tijuana anuncia a los que están dentro del albergue La Bodega aún que usarán la fuerza. El bus que ya salió con un grupo de migrantes dicen que los llevan a la comunidad de Loma Bonita donde una iglesia será habilitada como albergue. So they were told that they would be taken to uh, Loma Bonita area where there is going to be a church that was going to be made into a uh, facility for them to go into. Huh. Um, I know that they're also being told that they're going to be taken to El Barretal. There are other different shelters, churches and stuff that people can go to besides El Barretal. It's like mm -hmm. not the only place. Yeah. Some people really don't want to go to the Barretal, so they would choose, they would prefer to go someplace else. And mm. if there are enough places to go, you might get a place to go that's different. Yeah. But I wanted you to go back to that post for a second of Sandoval. If you scroll down, keep scrolling down. And that's, the, that's not down. Is that it? That's it. Okay. But um, the the way that they're posting these these uh, stories is as if the aggressors isn't 
the caravan that refused to leave the street and that occupied a street and closed down businesses on that street and also the schools on that street for over a month and then demanded that the Mexican government pay for another shelter in a different location of the city just for them for a month, which they did and has now concluded they don't show them as the aggressors making these crazy demands. They show them as the victims being evicted onto the streets as if they had a right to live there forever and have the government pay their rent. They don't. But this is what Mark Lane of TYT is signaling about their support and what shelter they've been helping. Remember, there is a Caritas shelter that uh, Bertie Gutierrez and many uh, Redwater, Drain Redwater and Weaka Eagleman were um, also visiting where they were taking donations. Do you want to read what the Minority Humanitarian Foundation yes. of Mark Lane's had to say about them? Today, we brought donations down to the Caritas shelter. We also brought a deposit check to begin the process of building a new bathroom, shower, and roof enclosure for the asylum seeker families who live here. As you can see, these are much needed renovations. Thanks to the relentless fundraising of our friends at this is about humanity. We are only $1,800 away from reaching our goal. Here's the donation link to help us complete this project. Send your money now. So there, these people uh, are actually investing, apparently, or they claim at least that they're investing in infrastructure for a shelter there in Mexico, uh, yeah. uh, which, which is good. I think that's good. Yeah. Although I don't know if the money's going to where they say it's going to. Um, I did tell you about Mark Lane's organization's history. It's just brand new. I mm -hmm. think it's not connected to the one from before, although him and the guy that were on the same, you know, uh, downtown business association group oh, yeah. were connected in mm -hmm. that way. So he may have just like liked the idea and thought, I'm going to take that name and call my new organization that. Um, and of course, there's, the fact that he works for Jenk Huger, that he mm -hmm. works directly mm -hmm. for Jenk Huger. He doesn't appear to have a background in humanitarian aid for migrants or refugees. He, in fact, I told you, used to run a seafood restaurant. Mm -hmm. That is his claim to fame. So um, uh, he's just doing this humanitarian work, which, you know, you, you have to commend people for having a, a good pace in their heart where they want to do humanitarian work mm -hmm. but when you don't know what you're doing and you're working on something that's this dangerous yeah and puts people at risk you could be doing more harm than good and especially if you're working with people like tyt yeah. especially if you're working with some of these organizations which we have showed you have hidden agendas and have done harm in the way that they've reported or failed to report or omitted information mm -hmm. or hid information about cases that they had direct involvement with, as TYT did. So um, I'm very uh, suspicious of what they're doing with these shelters and what they're going to be doing going forward involving themselves. Now they've talked about purchasing shelters for the, they, that they're running, mm -hmm. that the migrants are, migrant run shelters, helping fix some of the shelters that are already in existence, and also continuing to control the narrative, the control of the shelters paid for <clears throat> by the federal government. Yep. Here's what Sandoval had to say about shelters, saying, talking about how they needed to buy their own shelters. What did she say? Honey? Thank you again. I am speechless for all your generosity. She Compl was referring to her PayPal there. Yep. Thank you. Again, I'm speechless for all your generosity. Completely unexpected. Feliz Año Nuevo. These funds will be helping many of our Central American fam who are holding it down in El La Zona front, Fronteriza. 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 At the border zone in Tijuana. We must commit to building new and more robust autonomous infrastructure. Yes, migrant aid that is migrant-led. This is key not charity infrastructure buildings housing and land for and run by those who are impacted facilitate more spaces for social justice ad advocacy for the exodus at the mexican side of the border no more 
performative or rhetorical social justice activism. Please help uplift the voices and the stories of Central American Exodus by following, liking, and sharing this Migrant Media Collective page. Saying that you're not going to be performative and actually not being performative are two different things. Just because you wish for something to not be just window dressing, performative, metaphorical, rhetorical BS Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that isn't exactly what you're doing. Exactly. All while putting people in danger. Yeah. And also, you know, some of the stuff she said in there, it's like, I don't think you can go by land, be in America, go by land in Mexico for a group of people from another country. The land ownership rules don't work that way. They, They don't care. They don't care. They just spout this idealistic <laughs> stuff and, and and they have the higher moral ground because they said it first. That's you know? right. That's right. And of course, this was posted in uh, Fuera Ho page. There is another caravan on oh, its yeah. way as we speak. They're expected to reach Tijuana. Again, same border city. Wow. Same bottleneck issue. This is done in the most disorganized fashion For a reason, they want to create and maintain the crisis at the Tijuana border. And they're bringing another 15,000 migrants on their way right now from San Pedro Sula. That's a lot of people. That is a lot of people. We'll see how many of them actually make it to the border. Mm -hmm. But I think that right now, after all of this time that has already passed, and as people in Mexico are beginning to wake up and make the connections and understand who these organizers, American organizers are, as they are being exposed in articles, in videos, in stories, as they're being connected to each other and their positions and places of organizing like Enclave Caracol and others are known by the public. How are these folks going to continue to manipulate this caravan and the authorities not do anything about it? I don't know. I know that the people in Tijuana's nerves are wearing thin. I can tell you that there are a couple of things I have noticed that have really um, piqued my attention. The first of which are a series of videos, most of which I have not shared, of criminalities being committed by people within the caravan. Hmm. Um, And that isn't even focusing on the misdemeanor types of crimes like public drunkenness, lewd behavior, uh, disturbance of the peace, etc., etc., etc. No, I'm talking about breaking into people's houses, uh, committing rape, etc. Like I'm talking about serious, serious crimes, and that also, in addition to. The fact that they're occupying the street for so long and making demands while they do it and uh, staging these protests in which they're claiming that they're being oppressed by the people that are housing them all the while thanking the Mexican government that is housing them. These mixed messages, these mixed media messages that may very well have been uh, handed down to them by the orders of their puppet masters on high. Uh, But they were very, they were not well thought out and they are landing like a Led Zeppelin. They're literally causing more turmoil for the people in the caravan than I think the folks that are organizing this anticipated. And to add insult to injury, the people of Mexico are noticing that a lot of these people are addicts that are just shiftless, that want to hang outside of the shelters uh, that where they're currently staying and beg for money, many of which uh, are then later seen drunk, circling the um, the shelters where they are no longer welcomed inside because of their drunken state. And there is also the fact that within all of this, the Mexican people are putting in juxtaposition the caravan goers, their demands, their militancy, and their high-level foreign organization and donation system directly from the United States that is going to buy them, going to buying them new clothes, jackets, coats, and even providing them with trips to pizza parlors and 
safe houses where they get to play pool and hang out and go out and have fun with this shelter for people that have been deported into Mexico from the United States. <laughs> this is an open air shelter that's been there for I don't know how long. This is a clip of a video that's gone viral on the interwebs. On uh, YouTube, I'll have the link for vote for folks that want to watch the whole thing. It really is heartbreaking because he interviews an old man who had uh, been attacked by, an, uh, by a couple of kids with an ice pick, which they punctured into his lung, after which he went to the hospital, only to find that his lung was infected and had been filling up with liquid, uh, infected liquid like pus, which needed to be drained and or dealt with in some other form and that the hospital rather than dealing with him or helping him because of his serious medical conditions simply took him out the back door and dumped him on the streets and he was talking about you know how what he needed and how he felt watching this militant angry demanding violent uh factors of this caravan um and all of the support that they were getting from the military, the the Marines, the federal police security, the porta potties, the clothing, the donations, the food, the medical assistance that they were being um, provided at two different even at two different locations, at three different locations, while this group of deported Mexicans, Mexicans, citizens of the country that they're currently in have had no help and you will see that some people that are there um in this video if you watch the whole thing talk about being there for months and months like i've been here for nine months i've been here who knows there's probably people in this group that have been there for even longer and they um, are trying to await a time in which they can try to return into the united states many of them it really is heartbreaking but the juxtaposition of seeing this camp that has been there probably for years um that is tidy clean where they get no support from the government where they constantly get shaken down by police for trying to wash cars or do some kind of odd jobs in the vicinity just to make a daily living it is a juxtaposition that would infuriate anyone but especially the people of mexico take a look at this clip from beto alfa noticias no sabía si sí sabía que había algo aquí de migrantes, pero no estaba bien eh, educado sobre el tema. Y no debería ni estar comentando que no sabía, ¿eh? porque yo soy plenamente honesto y he siendo plenamente transparente con todos ustedes. Y es una de las cosas que es la diferencia. Hola, mija, ¿cómo estás? ¿Bien? <ríe> he sido plenamente transparente con ustedes y eso no me hace una mala persona, sino to to totalmente todo lo contrario. Quieren que les mienta, les puedo decir que aquí yo sé de este, de este albergue de hace dos, tres años, ¿verdad? Pero no, no es así. Vean nada más. Señores, esto es el albergue El Mapa. Vamos a, vamos a platicar con uno de las personas que quiero yo que ustedes... Eh, tomen enfoque para que vean qué es lo que sucedió con esta persona y qué atención médica está teniendo. Es, es, es algo realmente triste. That is the shelter El Mapa. Like I said, it's been there for a very long time. They have no porta potties. They have no potable water. They have no medical assistance. They have nobody that gives them donations or food or anything. And it is infuriating to the people that live in Tijuana to the people of Mexico, the citizens of that country, to watch their own countrymen go without a single shred of support. While people from Honduras in a non-organically formed caravan of tens of thousands of people that were literally brought to their city to create a crisis and to create a bottleneck of asylum seekers are um, given everything to the degree that they don't want to go out and look for work. Meanwhile, the people at this shelter called El Mapa, the map, are shaken down for trying to do odd jobs like washing cars and have to go out and pick up trash like, you know, 
collect cardboard to try to sell for just a few pesos. It is a sad contrast, but it is also one that more people like this viral video are making very apparent to the people, not only of Tijuana, but all of Mexico. And then there is this, the frequent and more common interviews between caravan goers and the Mexican media, where they are increasingly being caught in their own words as being ungrateful, as being um, demanding, like saying things like, I don't want to stay here and work because the Mexican peso is equivalent to the Honduran impira. So why would I stay here and find a job if I can only make as much money as when I was home? I might as well have stayed home. But they're not home. They're in Mexico asking for a handout from the Mexican government and refusing to work because they can't make what they'd like to make. <laughs> they're going to wait for the dream job while the federal, federal government in Mexico pays for their housing and their food. Sorry, folks. That's not the way that things work. It doesn't work here in the United States that way. It certainly doesn't work that way in Mexico. And what is becoming increasingly clear is that a lot of these folks, they don't want to work because they have serious drinking or other, uh, you know, abuse of, of drug problems mm -hmm. that keeps them from being able to work. In the video I'm about to share with you by um, Moitos TV, I recommend that you watch this thing and if you can understand Spanish, really listen to the interview that he has with these men because he asks them about their job situation and one guy who is wearing a cap, he doesn't talk in this clip I'm going to show you, but he does in the full video and he's drunk. He's slurring his words through the interview, but he can actually carry on a conversation. The clip I'm going to show you shows a third guy walking up in between the two that were being interviewed who is so drunk, he cannot, he's blacked out drunk. He cannot speak. He makes these weird animal noises and he can't walk. His eyes can't even stay focused. He just like, he is a wreck. And the other two kind of go silent. By the way, this, the, the, the first guy that was being interviewed, that's kind of wearing the baseball cap, he said he doesn't want to work yet because he's still resting his body from the long 40, my, 40 days of walking. Mm-hmm which we know to be a lie and you don't need a month to recover or, or two months now to recover from something that you, you know, didn't even do two months ago. Yeah. And then he admits that he, there are cars that come to pick people up to work every day, but he doesn't really want to go. And maybe next year, maybe in the new year, he's going to go. The other guy gets asked about it and he says he has taken jobs, day jobs and gone to work. And they ask him, if he does some things for fun when he's not working and he says, yeah, he likes to drink. And he asks him, well, where do you get money to drink? He goes, well, from the day jobs I do from, you know, from other things I get money and, and then I, I can go buy an alcohol. And he's like, doesn't it affect you? Do you think people here have a drinking problem? Do you think there's people that have a drinking problem that have a, you know, a substance abuse problem? And he said, yeah, it's pretty common. And he goes, do you think that that is the reason why so many of them are unable to maintain a job or go and look for work? Maybe that's the reason why they are not getting hired for jobs. Is that a reason? Is that a possibility? He goes, oh, no, it doesn't impair my ability to work. It makes me stronger. You take a drink and it gives you more strength to keep on working. <laughs> that's what he says. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then... The third guy walks up in between them and does this. Here's the video clip. Cuando nos comentan que el señor de café es mexicano. Este, entonces están contentos aquí prácticamente, ¿no? Aquí estamos unidos como familia. Está bien. 
Pero ahí tiene, ahí tiene. Todos los días hay este tipo de problemas. <laughs> the guy goes, yeah. Is this an everyday kind of a thing here? <laughs> And the other people are like, Oh, yeah, it's pretty common. Pretty common. So, how do you suppose the Mexican people, especially the people living in that neighborhood, feel about having scenes like that every day where people no longer able to, because of their substance abuse, go into the shelter? Uh, that are refused entry into the shelter or just wandering around drunk <clears throat> outside. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's it's a problem, folks. And it's a problem that the people in the city of Tijuana and the authorities uh, that are there have had to put up with, with for quite some time. It's not a good look and it probably won't be tolerated for much longer. Um, I suggest that those that are in this uh, caravan clash uh, organizing group begin to think about how they're affecting the people of Mexico. They keep talking about that eagle and condor prophecy. Mm -hmm. Now they're including the Quetzal, which is representative <clears throat> of the of the Aztecs, which is representative of the Mexican people. You added it late and you added it because you realized you were stomping all over the people hosting you. But I think it's a little bit too late. And you continue with one hand to beg and with the other hand to browbeat the Mexican people and the authorities that have been hosting these folks in the shelters. Thank you for being here uh, on a Mexican Crossing Line with your host, Cindy Gomez Shemp. And Duke Gomez Shemp. You've been listening to Mexican Crossing Lines on 88.1 FM, KPPPLP Fargo Moorhead, where we are adding local color to your airwaves. Come back and see us soon. Have a good night.